It's time for Twit this week in tech. It was financial reporting week. Apple, Facebook, Amazon. Whew! Big tech is just getting bigger. Russia versus Apple, a big decision coming up for Apple in July. And 10 years later, is the iPad a flop or a hit? We'll talk about it next on Twit. This Week in Tech comes to you from Twit's LastPass Studios, securing every access point in your company. Doesn't have to be a challenge. LastPass unifies access and authentication to make securing your employees simple and secure. Check out lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is, is Twit. twit. This is Twit, This Week in Tech, episode 756, recorded Sunday, February 2nd, 2020. Don't doubt your vibe. This Week in Tech is brought to you by Molecule. Molecule is reimagining the future of clean air, starting with the air purifier. For 10% off your first air purifier, visit Molecule.com and enter the code TWIT10. And by Capterra. Find the right tools to make an informed software decision for your business. Visit Capterra's free website at capterra.com slash twit. And by Wasabi Hot Cloud Storage. Thinking about moving your data storage to the cloud? Wasabi is enterprise class cloud storage at one-fifth the price of Amazon S3 and up to six times faster with no hidden fees for egress or API requests. Calculate your savings and try Wasabi with free unlimited storage for a month at wasabi.com. Use the offer code TWIT. And by ZipRecruiter. Hiring isn't easy, but there is one place you can go where hiring is simple and smart. That place is ZipRecruiter, where growing businesses connect to qualified candidates. Try it free at ziprecruiter.com slash TWIT. It's time for Twit This Week in Tech, the show where we talk about the week's tech news in obsessive detail. Devendra Hardawar is here, senior editor from Engadget. Always a pleasure to see you, Devendra. Howdy. Always happy to be here. <laughs> what is going on over your left shoulder? Is that an I know, It's just like that is my pile of review <laughs> gadgets, and I just like I've given up. And there's also that's the cat tower ah, that has fallen. A, and it's, it's a collapsing it's cap tower. I knew yeah. it. I thought it looked familiar. <laughs> Uh, how's the baby? She is great. You'll probably hear her crying amidst this episode, too. Uh, okay. She's doing well, just Good. starting to walk and oh, uh, getting more confident nice. with that. So it's very that's exciting. Awesome. Well, it's great to have you. I like to catch up with our, uh, oh, our yeah. friends when they join us. Wesley Faulkner is also here. Got a new job down there in Austin. He's developer relations guy at MongoDB. Nice. Hello. Howdy. Howdy that's a, Mongo's a no SQL. Am I right? Yes, it's a document-based uh, database as uh, opposed to relational. I'm a fan. I love the Mongo. And uh, it's good to have you. Welcome back. Thank you for having me. Also here, Brian back. McCullough from the Tech Meme Ride Home Podcast. Hello, Hi, Brian. Leo. Internet hey. historian. A little bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mostly podcaster now. It is a palindrome day. As Twitter never stopped reminding me all day long, zero two zero two two zero two zero internationally, the first palindromic day internationally in nine hundred years. Woo! Also, it, you say internationally because no matter what format you do it, yeah, that's okay. right. Month, day, day, month doesn't matter. It is palindromic, backward and forward. It also, Punxsutawney Phil predicted a quick spring this year. And the San Francisco 49ers trounced the Kansas City Chiefs 100 to nothing. One of these things is not, is not yet true. Uh, Apple made a lot of money. That's true. In Q4, the uh, color charts are up. From uh, Jason Snell's fabulous six colors, he's become famous now for these charts. I asked Jason, "How many hours does it take to make these?" He says, "It's all automatic." I don't know. Sixty-one percent revenue from phone wearables. Eleven services going up. Fourteen percent 
Mac and iPad are kind of the laggards there, but it was, yeah, a record Apple quarter. That that first quarter, first fiscal quarter of the year, which is the fourth calendar quarter, is the big selling. So $22.2 billion in profit in three months. Wow. Wow. That's, yeah, money, 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 money. Um, Apple also announced one and a half billion active devices in the marketplace more than uh microsoft more than anybody that's yeah. are there that many people in the world it's an amazing number yes there are obviously but they're only seven billion so one and a half billion is pretty good penetration yeah the only number 80 percent are on ios 13 yeah yeah that was surprising also, yeah 80 percent total on the latest ios go ahead devendra Sorry, total Facebook users too is, I think, like an interesting number because that's what upwards of two billion now or close to yeah. three billion. Like, yeah, they announced we are we're reaching crazy points. Facebook also had great results, uh, and there it was the monthly active users was over two billion, but even the daily active users was like a billion and a half. It was I can't remember the numbers exactly. Maybe you guys do, but it was like wow. Mm -hmm. Not Stephen uh, King though. He's 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 he is a Facebook recuser. The, hold on, I got it right here. Daily active users, 1.66 billion. What? Monthly active users, 2.5 billion. Jeez. But then, you know what, Devendra, what I think you're thinking about is if you count across the entire family of apps. Yes. Uh, yes. Where's that I number? That's that. that's the one, that, uh, 2.89 billion. Once app, yeah. Instagram, and Facebook together, 2.89 billion. Uh, that's, om that's almost half the world's I mean, it is almost certainly everybody on the internet, right? Yes. We estimate yes. about three billion on the internet, or like over over the age of twelve, because I think um, um, Benedict Evans has a thing up about that today. <sighs> um, so if you count adults, we're getting to half. It's insane. It's just crazy that we're talking about billions when it comes to devices and users at this point from single companies, not yeah. just like you know everybody on the internet, but one company has this huge slice of the pie. It's insane. Is is big tech too big? Certainly, there. That's the current, you know, thought among all the Democratic candidates. Anyway, Devinder is big. So. Is big tech too big? I, I think so. I think we've gotten way, way too big. And you know, we've talked about this the last few times I've been on. It does feel like uh, the tech you know, industry ha has come from the mentality of kind of being the outsiders. You know, the ones who have been fighting against the man, and now they are the man, and they are so big that you know countries don't know how to deal with them. They're bigger, you know, Facebook is bigger than most countries and the power and influence these things wield. There's nobody to keep them at check except for their CEOs who all seem to be either clueless or out of the loop or just have no clue how to handle this power. Or so, children. Yeah, <laughs> They're children. we need something. <laughs> They're young people. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know what the, I mean, if you, if you uh, stipulate, as I think everybody does, that big tech is maybe too big, I don't know what you do about it. I don't know if there's anything to do about it. So Can I push back and say it depends on what you mean by too big? Yeah. You know what I mean? Because, like, I, I, I think I might have even said this on this show before. Like, you know, the only previous to this, like, the only company that you could think of that's like, okay, my addressable market is every human being on the planet is maybe like Coca-Cola. But no one yep. is like Coca-Cola shouldn't sell that's a good to point. every human being. It, it just depends on what you do with what but that's have, that is kind of the point because Coca-Cola doesn't have influence over how people think, what they wear, who they vote for. But they have for. huge cultural influence is the thing. Like I've been to uh, – my family's from Guyana, South America. So I've been to remote villages in South America, you know, far from civilization. And the one thing you can count on getting is a nice cold, you know, Coke. But that's a, a good thing. That's a good thing, but <laughs> – What's wrong we look with at that? like we look at the rising obesity levels <laughs> oh, across the world. Obesity. Like all these com all these companies are kind of there is there is that, this. but they can't yeah. leverage sugar water to do other things That's like right. you know yeah. destroy markets or you know uh, uh, mess with democracies, things like that. I think, but nobody really. Uh, and you, I apologize. You're right. We always talk about this, so I'll stop. But a final thought. I <laughs> no, think, let's keep talking about it, please. <laughs> I think nobody really. It's a big thing thought about what it would mean if a handful of companies dominated the discourse mm -hmm. in society not just u.s society but global society yeah nobody I also really feel like at least in terms of the tech people there aren't as many people maybe even thinking like the way steve jobs used to like thinking in a broader mindset and about what their stuff means and what it means for the world and 
I, yeah, I feel like the philosophy, the striving a lot of tech these days is very much like, let's get as many users as possible to hell with what it means for democracy or anybody for that matter. Well, and Apple's a good case in uh, point. Mm -hmm. um, you were a participant in the Six Colors annual uh, report card, Devendra, uh, along with uh, others uh, well-known. And uh, one of the number one complaints people seem to have, I don't remember what your thoughts were on this, was that... Uh, it was unseemly that Apple uh, provided a essentially a campaign photo op for the president in uh, Austin at the plant down there. Um, that was of all the things people were most unhappy about. It was Apple's political behavior. Almost definitely. And Tim Cook was right there, like within the first few months Trump was in office. You know, sitting at the table along with other you know major CEOs and just suffering through. Those I, meetings. I would have yeah. said that's his job as a CEO. It's, it's regardless yeah. of who's uh, president or what policies he enforces. You know, your job is as an as and this is the problem with tech being too big is that really uh, it's a business and your job is to make more money. And mm -hmm. that's Tim Cook's doing his responsible being a responsible CEO um, which means that and, and I've said this before companies are amoral. They don't have a sense of good or bad they're there to make money how important is uh, apple's massive flex plant in austin where they're cranking out dozens if not hundreds of mac pros wesley <laughs> uh, it's it's not that big um also um I, I mean it's big for i mean for a piece of real estate but if you look at like Tesla's factory or something like that, it's nowhere yeah. compared yeah. In, into the, in that size, um, which is it's also once again it's not factory. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's it's uh, it's 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 been there for a while and it's it just blends into the the landscape. It's not anything yeah. very significant. It's a factory in the same way a Play-Doh Fun Factory is a factory. It's it's a, <laughs> it's the same way that my son's uh, Lego table is a factory. It's it assembles products. Yes, from exactly. All, from, all it, from all around the world. All over the they, world. they don't actually make anything. No raw material comes in and right. products come out. Um and if I could talk about like what you're saying that like, is tech too big i think the issue is that um the dependence on other companies to that build upon these technologies uh that is where their power comes from no one's building their business on just selling coke so but people are building an ad business a consultancy uh a, a photo editing, copywriting, all of that based on Facebook. Yeah, It's enabling so much. That's why so many more people are coming to depend on but it. But that's important, right? That's what a platform does. That's what Windows did in the 90s, right? It provided a stable platform for people to create businesses on. Sure. I, I would say we have... But the, the thing internet. is, it's controlled yeah. by Facebook in terms like yes. even Windows. If they say, hey, we're not allowed... Right. third-party applications, you just don't upgrade, right? right? You don't choose to move on to the next thing. You 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 can, in some ways, you have the ability to opt into those rules. But with yeah. Facebook, if they change something, everyone has to adopt that platform in that stance. Devinder, go it ahead. Does, it, it's good to remind people that we, we have the internet. This is the platform. This is the Wild West where we could create anything. I, I am a bit sad seeing companies like Facebook and all, like, basically consolidate how communication happens, how we think of the internet and the possibilities of the, of the internet. Like to me, that's really disappointing and very sad. So on a broader level, what can we do? We, we talk about this all the time. Regulation would be nice. People who actually understand the technology in government and in leadership uh, who can actually keep these companies in check too. Like I'm sure you guys talked about that Clearview AI story, yeah. but that, that stuff is insane. And the only reason... Google and others haven't done yet is because even they thought to themselves, this is crazy. We technology. can't do that. We can't do this. We can't go this far. But that's that also far. not preventing a small company uh, backed by Peter Thiel to, you know, invest in facial recognition tech and go crazy with it because nothing is stopping them. I feel like it's almost uh, the, the uh, closing the barn door after the horse is gone. That's yep. that's it's out there now. There's nothing we can do about it. Your face is everywhere and everybody's got it and law enforcement has it and. Uh, I admire, you know, companies like Apple for tr you know, at least trying to keep some lid on privacy. Of course, Apple, mm -hmm. one could say, only does that because their iAds product failed, and so they don't have any ad revenue, so they can <laughs> they can afford to say, oh, privacy is a good thing. 
Uh, yeah, but did, did you see uh, even that most recent acquisition they did? Um, <clears throat> well, first of all, the most I, I'm trying to remember the name of it. It's something dot AI X Xnor dot AI Xnor. Yeah. Um, yeah. So number one, the whole point is uh, that they. Um, in theory, you could do uh, any sort of uh, machine learning and AI stuff on the device so it doesn't have to go back to the cloud. So um, blah, That's blah, blah, great. Isn't that great? Right. Yeah. Privacy, privacy. But then also they backed out of that um, that Pentagon thing that Maven. Google had to back out of Maven. too. Yeah, so Exnor had a contract with the Pentagon to uh, do face recognition for drones. And this is the one uh, Google was going to get involved in, and Google's engineers petitioned them, and they pulled out. Apple not probably has nothing to do with politics. It probably has more to do with appearance. Uh, canceled that Maven contract once they bought Exnor. They said, yeah, well, so, like, we're not going to do that. It's an interesting thing that you were just talking about, like, well, this this independent company doing this facial recognition stuff. Like, this, this is a rare case of, like, one of the big platforms buying technology that maybe could be used for nefarious things and being like, no, we only want to use this for uh, stuff that maybe would be uh, consumer friendly and, and user friendly and privacy friendly. Yeah. Well, um, Xnor, if I remember correctly, also did the AI for Wise and Wise cameras. Oh, and they that's pulled right. Out of that contract. That's right. And so I'm guessing there's, there's a possibility they just canceled all contracts across the board, so that's everyone true. was available to work on their project. Yeah, I, Wise was left with their pants down because the face recognition uh, on the Wise cameras stopped working when Xnor got purchased. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, yeah, but uh, it looks good for Apple to say, "Well, we're not going to do the DoD." Thing. I think it's more complicated than that. Remember Jeff Bezos saying, look, it's patriotic. Companies in America have always done uh, their best work for the defense of this country. That's patriotic. What's wrong with that? I think people confuse abiding by the law and helping the government with right and wrong. Um, you know, turning in Nazis in Nazi Germany was what the government wanted and it was what was considered, turning Jews. quote unquote, a good yeah. citizen. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, and so, I mean, you can't you can't like put what's good and bad with what's the law and what's not the law. Those aren't the same thing. Oh, you sound also, like a you sound like a hippie. <laughs> I, I was I was gonna say there. I mean, like, there's a distinction between helping your country uh, remain strong with its national defense. And I get what you're saying in terms of like the, the division line between um, morally right and, and, and not. But Ford um, built uh, tanks and airplanes yeah, for yeah. Well, the American Ford, war effort in World did. War II. Everybody, everybody did. did. Yeah. And like, maybe and so they the made whole, a little money on it, but at the same time, it's the right thing to do. It's patriotic. And, well, and also firebombing Dresden, you can make all sorts of arguments is morally reprehensible and a, and a war crime yeah, and things like that. But, true. but the point and is... And Dow is, made napalm during Vietnam. And if, if all of this technology stuff is to get an edge... And I'm not making like I, I from I, I also applaud Apple for not uh, getting involved with um, this particular program. But if all of these technologies now like AI are what keep you ahead in military stuff, in defense, then at what point are you hobbling your own country if you if you right. don't participate? It's complicated, isn't it? Speaking of complicated, Apple's going to come up against a, a, a problem in Russia soon in november the parliament as we've talked about before passed uh what fast company calls the law against apple the law requires all smartphone devices in russia to preload russian apps uh ostensibly to support the russian economy but i think it's also feared that those russian apps might provide information to the government about its citizens uh apple always prohibits this uh, the law goes into effect in July, and some say, Fast Company says, this is going to force Apple to decide, do we allow Russia to put spyware on our phones or do we pull out of the market? What would or, you what would you do what would you do, Devendra? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it it would be nice to see Apple kind of resist this somewhat, but I mean every every tongue company is fine doing business in China, and right. that also involves quite a few, you know, privacy related issues there too. Except they're not preloading things in China, but it also seems like it's only a matter of time until 
that's something that's going to happen. Well, too. and Apple had to move the iCloud servers to China yep. for Chinese customers, uh, presumably mm -hmm. to companies that the Chinese government could then uh, g get into the servers. For sure. Um, it's it's really this is it's tough. Uh, we are now in a, a much more global environment than ever before. Markets uh, are global, and yet every country has its own laws. Every state has its own laws. Look at California with our new Privacy Act. All of a sudden, companies have to kind of do something separate for California than they might do in the rest of the country. Yeah, uh, but for Apple especially, this is so different from you know their whole philosophy of of we own the device, like it's pure. We do software and hardware. You know, even the, you know they still sell to China, but it's you. It's the that's same. That's like an aesthetic phone. thing, though. That's not a privacy thing. It's an aesthetic. Well, thing. no, but what I'm saying is, is that right? Be, beyond the the questions of kowtowing to uh, various regimes requests and things like that like i can see that it's also a little different because apple would essentially have to give up what it has said you know its entire life like you know we make a, the 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 product we deliver to you is exactly the way we yeah. want it to be yeah. as opposed to well in russia you're going to get some sort of chintzy mail or maps app or whatever whatever but they also seems the, like they didn't they remove the news app in for the China market too. I mean they have they've made, made concessions. They uh, took the Chinese for flag for governments before. They took the uh, Taiwanese flag off the emojis uh, in Hong Kong and China. They yeah they've done that kind of thing all along, right? Around the around bit. the edges, but again, what I'm saying around is around the edges. Yeah, it, like if if it's a if it's a, a a Russian photo app alongside photos, if it's a yeah big deal. Uh, yeah, but no, but all down the line, if it's email, if it's the if it's a br the browser, I'm assuming is the the prime thing that the government wants to load up there as well. Well, it'll be very interesting. Come July, <laughs> I can't wait to see. You got this is one situation where it seems like the business value, if it's three billion dollars or it's not something close to that, it's not that big to Apple, a company with such a huge war chest. Like they can they can take that hit and have the goodwill of being the company that said no to Vladimir Putin. Basically, I think they would love that, yeah. except then China comes along and now mm -hmm. you got a problem. So as soon as you make a concession to Russia, you, the next you got to look at you got to play the chess game a couple moves ahead. Now China's going to come to you and say, yeah, we'd like to do the same thing. Now, what do you do? Because you can't leave China. Exactly. Yeah. How's their black market? I mean, if if they pull out of Russia, will most of the people who can afford iPhones just import them anyway, and that's just a little bit of a, a Russia tax? That well, yeah, Apple doesn't like that. It used to be a problem in China. I remember uh, a few years ago, we'd go to the Apple store, get in line to buy an iPhone, and there'd be a ton of people waiting in line who were planning to, to who were on a mission to buy phones to send to China. And that's, you know, that's how they got the supply chain going. I know Apple didn't like that. Um, I don't know. It's a very, I'm just glad I'm not Tim Cook. Although he's got the wallet to um, maybe make up for any <laughs> emotional trauma. They're, they're, they had a record quarter. They're doing quite well. They did mention coronavirus. Uh, they've closed stores in China. They're worried that coronavirus could slow down production. China, Devinder, you're probably an expert on this, given your job. Uh, <laughs> China w shuts down anyway for the new year, right? They've been shut down all week. They decided to extend that shutdown for the Lunar New Year a little longer because of coronavirus. The market's open on Monday. I don't know if factories are going to start reopening, but there is some concern that production might be slowed, that Apple might even have to move production out of China. Um, yeah, I'm definitely not an expert on this. But oh, come on. Just yeah, say you it are. Do, it does you don't actually have to make – it makes a lot of sense, and especially continuing on from yeah, the New Year's holiday, like – that's that's not a huge deal in in right. the grand scheme of things. I it's going to be interesting to see how all the companies deal with the coronavirus outbreak. And I, honestly, I'm just I'm I'm a little worried too because it seems like China is not equipped for this. Most countries aren't equipped for a potential global pandemic. So actually, yeah, it's it's more than just Apple. China yeah. is so much better equipped than we yeah. are. I was just going to say we have well, they, we have they, dismantled our entire uh, pandemic. You know, team. That's true. We had That's Obama true. when uh, when Ebola uh, outbreak happened a few years ago. Created a cross uh, agency team to yeah. respond better to the, all of this. That's been dis dismantled. Well, 
not only that, have you seen the video of that hospital that they put together? Two in, weeks. Yeah. China built a 1,000 bed, several 1,000 bed hospitals for coronavirus victims in two weeks. Yeah. That, that, but that's after time of them delaying it and ignoring the problem and pretending it didn't exist. Like the, the best way to stop a pandemic is to acknowledge it, you know, and not try to hide it. And they, they tried for a very long time to stop this, basically, or to, to make people not aware they existed. Well, it's embarrassing when people get sick. But, <laughs> but, but only, I mean, compared to the flu, it'll be, there'll be more than 50,000 flu deaths in the U.S. this year. Mm -hmm. There's only been 260, I think. Yeah. Uh, get your flu shots, people. Yeah, you get the flu shot. Thing. Don't worry about coronavirus just yet. Uh, and you're right. It, certainly quick action. I just watched Contagion last night just to update myself <laughs> <laughs> on, on practices and, uh, you know, best practices in case of flu. Stay um, away from um, uh, Jude Gwyneth Law. Paltrow, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> oh, First of all, okay. don't have drinks with Gwyneth Paltrow. Yeah. Uh, not the greatest movie, but I know. The, here's why I watched it. I'm looking at iTunes. This movie came out in 2011. All of a sudden, it's in the top five movies on iTunes. I think I'm not alone. People go, what, yeah. do, we, what, do, we, what, what do you do? It's funny. We process our anxiety by watching movies, yeah. basically, these days. So. Nowadays, right. the worst horror movies are those. In fact, I have to. now that I'm thinking about it, there's a reason. You know, I, I, there was a guy at Cal who was an expert in sick joke cycles. He was he was great, Dundas, uh, Alan J. Dundas, something like that. He was great because he said they're always tied to our psyches, and we joke about the stuff that makes us most uncomfortable. And he would tie the various you know dead baby jokes had to do with uh, changes in abortion rights in America. He would tie this in, and I I bet you Dundas has some thoughts about why all the zombie movies became big over the last twenty years. And I have to think it's related to our concerns about global pandemics and epidemics. Mm -hmm. Like, this is yep. like our psyche processing, you know, and boy, you watch Contagion. It's a horror movie. Can I make you feel a little bit better? Yeah. I did uh, on my long read segment this week, I did uh, the New York Times piece about uh, coming up with vaccines. Hmm. And according to the piece in 2003, when SARS took uh, broke out, it took researchers about 20 months to get come up with a, a wow. vaccine after the, the genome was sequenced. Um, by the time of the Zika virus in 2015, that was brought down to six months, and they think they can do it in three months this time. Nice, because the whole the whole world is working together. Now the question is, it comes back to this idea of like if you you know once it's out of out of the door, like even if you come up with a, a vaccine within three months, well, it'll be already all the way all the way around the world at that point. So even even is three months too slow to actually stop it dead in its tracks? Yeah. Forget 1917, Academy Award nominated film about World War One. We should make one called 1918, about the flu pandemic of 1918. That killed what? It was a huge millions. Yeah. I'm surprised that's million, not like. I think. Yeah, that needs to be like a Netflix series or HBO series at this point. <laughs> there's there's several oh, great documentaries on it. I think one of them's from PBS actually. Yeah. Did you hear that uh, they're saying like one of the articles about how um, Apple's products are actually causing or not causing but not helping to prevent this because, um, you know, the coronavirus, um, which is a lot worse than the Dos Equis virus, um, it's, <laughs> it's transmitted it's a little dry. by spit yeah. and spittle. Oh, spit but and spittle. Apple's face ID doesn't work with the face mask off on. Oh. So in order to unlock <laughs> your phone, which people say you do like, you know, a, a uh, dozens of times a day, you take your face mask off in order to unlock your phone. Well, and that's what happened Which in Contagion. Means it helped transmit. Gwyneth okay. Paltrow did a selfie with some poor guy, and he died. So, well, Wesley, I actually thought about this this week. Like, oh. could we get? Please, I'm not I'm so a glad, rumor Brian. monger. <laughs> could we ever get a contagion that it's like all of a sudden people find out like a month or two months into it? It's because we all have our phones. And we're touching them 70, 80, 120 yeah. times a day. Yeah. And so oh, yeah. then because we never back in, in 1918, we didn't have one thing that we all touched so many times. And so that all of a sudden the cure is, is we all have to stop using our smartphone. Leo, that's your that's the, the Hollywood script. Yeah, There's right a there. movie right there. Let's go pitch it right now. <laughs> What we need. They're, they already make smartphone uh, like sanitizers, basically. So like I'm, I'm sure like everybody will just start well, using those things like crazy. Who can yeah. forget Douglas Adams and Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? They decided to ship all the useless people off. They told them 
the Earth, the planet is going to be destroyed. So we're going to make this giant spaceship and all the phone sanitizers, which apparently I didn't know until I read this book is a business in the UK. All the phone sanitizers got on the ship and were shipped off. There was no, obviously everybody else went on with their lives until a massive <laughs> epidemic caused by a dirty phone killed off everybody. What we need is something that will purify our air. <laughs> wow, you are good. That's Karsten Bondi, our producer, and he's apparently giving me the signal that it's time to mention our first sponsor of the show, Molecule. I do have my Molecule running, and the Molecule, the Molecule will kill viruses. It's actually better than a HEPA filter. HEPAs were invented during World War II, widely used in hospitals, but they're filters. They trap particles of a certain size, but the truth is indoor air pollutants, pollutants can be much, much smaller than those trapped by HEPA filters, including bacteria, mold, viruses, allergens, things that can make you sick, volatile organic compounds, formaldehyde from your carpet, paint from your walls. Molecule traps it all using something called PICO, photoelectrochemical oxidation. And actually, I have to say, we bought a molecule, I think it's now been a couple of years, because Lisa would wake up every morning with a headache because when we moved to the country, there were a lot of pollens and allergens, and she would just, she, we got the molecule, it fixed it. It fixed it. Her headache was gone, which was amazing. That's why we bought another one for Michael's room. We have one in the studio now. We love these things. They not only get all the allergens, all the toxic chemicals, all the viruses and the bacteria, they destroy them. That's what PICO does. It actually oxidizes them. So there's a blue light that goes, and it just destroys them. It also has a filter, so it gets everything. It's been great for us and our family. It's been verified by labs all over the country. It is an amazing technology. It'll help you sleep better. It'll help you breathe better. It'll help clean the air in your house. And if you're in an office where you can't open the window, you absolutely need a molecule. Indoor air can, up to be, can be up to five times worse than outdoor air, according to the EPA. That's that You've got to stop breathing that horrible air in your office and get a molecule. They've got the molecule air. That's the one we have here in the studio for large rooms. There's now an air mini for smaller rooms. Choose the molecule that fits your space the best. You can also pair it to your phone and automatically send you filters when you need new ones. You don't have to think about it. The phone, you can look on the phone and see the state of your molecule, but it'll also just order filters for you if you want. You don't have to. I just think the molecule is a great technology. For 10% off your first molecule, look at that too. It's beautiful cast aluminum. There's the mini on the, on the coffee table there. For 10% off your first air purifier, molecule is spelled with a K, M-O-L-E-K-U-L-E dot com, and use the offer code TWIT10 to get 10% off. We love our molecules. You will too. Molecule, it's been tested at the University of Minnesota Particle Calibration Laboratory and others, other universities. Molecule.com, offer code is TWIT10. This is the only air purifier I use and recommend. We love it. Molecule. Um, yeah, I didn't even think of that. We, have, we are defended against the coronavirus. So come on in, everybody. Come on in. Google's shutting down its uh, China offices, too. Um, let's see here. The EU has patented, I'm sorry, passed the measure uh, requiring a common charger standard. I'm a little confused because I've read stories that said this is the death knell for the lightning port, and I've read stories saying it doesn't have anything to do with the lightning port. Brian, which is it? Uh, I'm confused too, and I also don't know. Like, is this one of those recommendations? Like, but it's not coming into force as a law yet. Yeah, and it's then, a resolution. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, like, we we might be it might be one of those things where we're still so far ahead of the game. Like, they didn't pass a law that says for you know beginning at uh, 2021, all phones must be USB C or something like that. So I wish they would. Apple mm. says that would stifle innovation, would also stifle <laughs> profits because they make a lot of money on the Lightning port. The, the law only really talks about the adapter, saying universal adapter. I've read it several, several it's times. The, it's the brick, the and charging brick, right? It's the brick. So, yeah. But it doesn't talk about the port on the phone. That's and so why I, I thought show you this. Did, yeah. Uh, this is uh, USB-C on one side yep. and lightning on the other. There you they go. could add another dongle 
drop that into the box. Didn't Apple do that when it was uh, micro USB was required for charging? That for a while they put a dongle in the box and they stopped. I'm not sure yeah. why. So I mean, it it can convert all power bricks to USB C, but then they'll just ship this and still be able to use Lightning for all of their products, and they would get around the law. I'm surprised and also Apple they talked about this. Do doesn't like this because they use USB C on their laptops and their iPad Pros. Yeah. Yep. Why wouldn't they? Apple's very confusing. Very confusing. And it doesn't corner the market in terms of innovation, in terms of like uh, their own power standards, because they could say, uh, yeah, we'll use Qi on all of our stuff, but it'll max out at five watts. But you have to use the Apple branded one yeah. to use 35 watts or 45 watts or whatever the higher wattage because they want to make sure that your phone is safe. Um, so it could be you, <laughs> encryption or authorization or handshake to make sure it's an authorized Apple charger. So they can, in terms of accessories, they still can uh, lock it down even though it's a common standard. So it, you know, in terms of innovation, I think they're just fighting it. Wesley, if you've mm -hmm. actually read the law, because I saw that too, that like they, it, the, they're suggesting that we move all towards wireless charging. So in a way, the, the EU is, is pushing uh, Apple to eliminate more ports. Forget about headphone jacks. For, well, like, that was, wasn't there a rumor that they were going to eliminate the port on the iPhone next year? Maybe this year. I don't know. Good God. Well, so I know. Good God is right. They'll do an end run around the EU. But do way. we really go. need a connector on our phone? <laughs> they got rid of yes. the uh, headphone port. Well, let's just do everything wirelessly. I, I think until we have like true over the air wireless charging, um, wireless charging as it is now is just like it's a nice secondary thing. It's a nice thing that your phone could do once in a while if you have a you know wireless charging stand or something by your desk. But we like to use our phones while they're charging. And you can't do that easily with wireless. Uh, wireless is slower. It's more finicky. You don't know if like I know a lot of people who have wireless charging stands by their you know nightstands and half the time they misjudge like where exactly they put their phone or it shifts overnight and you, it stops or, charging. It's or too different finicky. phones. Like yep. I, you know, yep. I use the same one and like the, the, the last um, pixel phone didn't work. The, the, it works fine with the Apple, the iPhone. Like, yeah, it's, uh, it's not the same thing as like, this is a Jack that was designed for no. this device. Yeah. Samsung does that too. If you want fast charging, you have to buy their little brick. Uh, I think a lot of companies do that. Qualcomm has its own standard for quick charge. There's, but it would be nice if we all could. Can we all just agree? On the other hand, you don't want governments to say, "No, look, you can't use Quick Charge Three. You can't use Samsung's charge. You have to use this technology." You don't want a government mm -hmm. to tell tech mm -hmm. companies, "No, no, we're going to do this standard." That seems like a recipe for disaster, yeah. too. I think this goes back to what I was saying before. Like, it would be nice to have people in government and in leadership who understand the stuff enough not to just be like, "Oh, yeah, we just need," an, you know. A very dumb way to achieve universal charging standards. Um, we could do this in a smarter way that actually could make Apple, you know, want to use USB C in their phones. But maybe. I, I also honor their desire to mm -hmm. reduce e waste. Huge problem with yep. all these chargers, a lot of e waste. And it's good for consumers if you can, you know, get a couple of chargers and use it on all your mm -hmm. devices. That's good. So ever since we've moved to USB C charging for laptops, my life has been so yes. much easier. So much yes. easier. Yes, people I forget so many laptops. Phones, yeah. every phone used to have a different charger. They do remember every laptop used to have a different charger. Now it's a much more unified place. The only the only exception is Apple stuff. Well, Apple, Apple stuff and like that, gaming uh, laptops. This is actually going to cause more e waste because everyone's has to dump their lightning cables too. Oh. So air all the lightning, all the 1.5 billion is uh, was the last thing we talked about of Apple devices. All of those cables are going to go into the dump, and so that's their argument of saying how this law hurts uh, e waste. Apple, I'm sorry, Amazon was at great pains during its quarterly results call to tell you they pay a lot of taxes. This zero tax is BS. Uh, Apple actually, uh, I keep saying Apple, Amazon actually had a blog post about how much they spend on, on taxes. <laughs> All the jobs they created. A billion dollars in federal income tax in 2019, 2.4 billion in other federal taxes, including payroll taxes and customs duties, 1.6 billion dollars in state and local taxes, and last year alone, Amazon collected and remitted nine billion dollars in sales and use taxes to states and localities. So, so there. Okay. 
You can only you can only pay taxes when you report profits, right? Yeah, it's really up mm -hmm. to Amazon. I swear to God, they got a little dial in Jeff Bezos's office. How much do we pay this year? How much do we how much do we make this year? They made a lot of money. Amazon, uh, eighty-seven point four billion dollars in quarterly revenue, up twenty-one percent year over year. Net income three point three. They're not nearly as profitable as uh, as Apple is. Net income of three point three billion dollars. That's up from three. But as you're saying, they never want to be. That's right. That's exactly right. It could be anything you want, Jeff. How much money do you want to make this year? Just turn that knob. Because they just reinvested, right? He did say, for the first time, I don't remember Bezos ever saying how many Amazon Prime subscribers there are. He did uh, tell us uh, there are 150 million paid Prime subscribers globally. Is he uh, He must have said it. At some other time, because that's up from the 100 million 21 months ago. Which was, I think, a guess 21 months ago. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, I think people were projecting that number, as I remember. I don't know. You you and I do a lot of news. It, it all blurs after a while. I, can't, I literally cannot remember <laughs> when I get home at, at 6 p.m. And my wife will say, what did you talk about today? No, and I'm like, no, no idea. Yeah, Lisa no does idea. that. She says, is there anything I should know about? It's like... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there is. Listen to the podcast. <laughs> it's gone from my mind completely. <laughs> um, let's see. What else? It's gone from my mind. We did Apple. We did Amazon. Facebook had a good quarter. We mentioned their... Uh... Oh, I know. So this last week was the 10th anniversary of the iPad. I thought the iPad was a pretty good thing. I like my iPad. Apparently, I'm uh, I'm a loser. Everybody agrees. <laughs> the iPad, uh, Ben Thompson, the headline on Stratechery, the tragic iPad. Uh, John Gruber, it's a disappointment. Even in this, uh, even in this uh, thing, Devendra, that you and everybody else got to do, but I wasn't invited to. That Jason Snell does the uh, <laughs> Apple report card. You would have gave him the iPad the D plus or something. I thought the iPad was pretty good. What's wrong with the iPad? What'd you That's give a good it? Question. What'd you give it to Vindra? I didn't. I, uh, I forget. What you don't I remember it in the in the report card, but it, it does seem like we should at least give the iPad credit for being the lap the tablet that survived. You yeah. know, it's the thing that inspired yeah. everybody to make tablets, and now like there there are, there are certainly very few Android tablets I think are worth buying. Um, Microsoft took the strategy of like trying to turn Windows into a tablet thing. So convertible PCs technically are tablet-like, but I still don't like the way Windows handles tablet stuff. So, you know, the iPad is the only successful tablet, and that makes a lot of sense. It's been doing good business for them. I think where Apple falters is in terms of like supporting uh, multitasking. They were slow to that. They were slow to like turning the iPad into a usable computing platform, but as a tablet um, you know, I, I think they deserve credit for at least being successful and, you well, know, trying to push things forward. I will way. tell you what you said because <laughs> I, <laughs> I have the transcript. You actually Thank said you. Uh, every gadget geek should own one. And actually, I, yeah. I overstated its bad grade. It got a B plus. B so, plus sounds about right. That's and not, certainly yeah. like as of last year or two years ago when the base iPad was like 230 bucks. It's like, yeah, you should have one. Yeah. I have one. Yeah. Like it's uh, everybody that should was have one. That was the first iPad I bought myself, too, and I bought it specifically so my parents can FaceTime my baby daughter, and it's been perfect for that. So every night at dinner time, hit a button, you know, go straight to my mom's phone or my dad's phone, and they get to see Sophia every single night, and that is far easier than most other solutions out there. One thing a lot of people agreed on, uh, including Ben Thompson and John Gruber, is the uh, multitasking, the split screen and the slide over. They, they they seem to agree that that's very poorly implemented. Um, I think everybody on MacBreak Weekly said, yeah, they should just dump the multitasking uh, because it doesn't work very well. And this they they blame this not on Steve Jobs, whose original conception they think was right on. I would agree, mm -hmm. but uh, on subsequent um, software developers over the years. I think how, how, we can blame. Sorry, we can we can blame uh, who's the, who's the, who's the scapegoat? Everybody at Apple blames. For everything wrong with Apple, he was fired. I can't remember his name, but he's, he's like, "Oh, we got rid of him." He's Johnny Ive. No, maybe you could blame Johnny now. We blame Johnny Ive for a lot. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, uh, Rubenstein or somebody like that. No, yeah. it was. Uh, oh, I can't remember his name. Anymore. The map, the guy that did the map stuff. But yeah. but but Leo, how much of this is? And I I think about this a lot. Like there's certain people out there who maybe and maybe we can blame Steve Jobs because he made the the trucks versus cars thing. So there's a certain segment of people that believed that tablets would replace the, you know, the computer, right? And so the fact that 10 years on, that's what this is about, right? Is that there are certain people that are disappointed that you still need something with a keyboard and a mouse. And, and but I, 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 I so if, if, if it's just that it's not doing everything yet, that doesn't mean that it's a failure as a product, right? Mm-hmm. No, yep. I think it's a. I think a lot of the complaints are more that it should be better. It mm. should be more like stagnant. That it's a little stagnant, and I think with yeah. iPad OS they've been making some progress. But I guess people wanted more from the iPad. I, I do feel like yeah, the iPad Pro right was their next step. Scott for Forstall, hardware. thank you, yep. chat room. Scott yes. Forstall, it's all Scott's fault. It's all Scott's fault. Uh, iPad Pro, though, great hardware. Like, we've loved the hardware. It's been well-reviewed, uh, you know, since they launched that thing. Um, and certainly in the most recent years, like, it's beautiful. But the software has always been slow to catch up to that hardware. Yeah. So Apple, they've been lagging on macOS software and iOS, too. Like, they, they have a lot of software innovation they really need to focus on. But the iPad as a computer replacement, I think a lot of people I talk to, even tech journalists, some people use that for all they do, you know, for image editing, for reporting, I personally couldn't live that way, but it certainly it would be great for like a weekend way to go and just write a long thing and not have to worry too much about but, like. But that's my that's kind of my it. point is yeah. that it's all these people that are like, well, I'll never need a computer again. I'll have this yep. tablet and I can. And, and so it's just the disappointment of those people that imagine that that's what they were going to have by now. And, and what if the answer is, is that. Again, you have a car for something, you have a truck for something, you got a semi for something. Like so, all right, a, a tablet is great for, like you were saying. Uh, I did FaceTiming with the with the grandparents this afternoon. Like so, so what that the tablet didn't kill the laptop? Like who cares? Yeah, yeah. I think the problem is that uh, it's all all of this stuff so expensive. If like all of us, somebody's buying you <laughs> this stuff. Uh, you can have an iPhone, an Apple, uh, MacBook, a Windows machine, an iPad, and then it kind of all is a continuum of stuff, and you use the right thing for the right time. But if you had to only choose one, it probably wouldn't be the iPad. Right. And, that, and normal have, people have to choose one. They're so expensive. The, from my yeah. friends, the I, I don't use a Mac, but the value prop that they have seen the most out of iOS 13 is Sidecar. Um, and so it's it's they've given up on using the iPad for everything. But as a companion to their laptop, it is that feature makes it far more usable for them. And so mm -hmm. if, if Apple was choosing not to focus at being standalone, but actually part of a workflow where it's easy to work with it or applications or other hardware uh, I think that is the true nature and the true purpose of iPad where it could really shine. Uh, let me take a break. I want to pick this conversation up because I've been working on a theory, and you can help me develop this, about where computing is going, going forward. And it, the iPad works into this. But 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 like, we need to take a break because the Super Bowl is going to start any minute now, and I want to get out of here in five minutes. Uh, our show today brought – no, I don't. We have another hour. Our show today brought to you by Captera. <laughs> Uh, if you're in business, you need software, right? But so much business software is, can I be blunt, crap. Mostly because you're using old stuff. You, you see, that's why so many people are still running Windows XP, Windows 7, Windows 95, Internet Explorer 8. Because they have an old program that, you know, the boss's nephew Joey wrote when he was in school. Now he's moved to... Borneo and he's not updating it, but that's the only thing. Captera is a directory of all the best enterprise software, the big categories like CRM, uh, the little stuff too, like you know, individual line of business software like Yoga Studio Management. You can there are 700 categories, thousands of programs in here. No longer, it doesn't make sense to Google it. Doesn't make sense to ask people. Just go to Captera.com/slash/twit. You can find the right software. It's really easy. To say here, you know, here's the category. Here's what I'm looking for. They then have customized filters 
that are applied to that specific program, you know, how many seats, if it's on the web or if it's on premises, if it's, you know, just if it's a yoga studio, whether you can make appointments, you know, all the stuff that you need, you click those boxes and you narrow it down. You can do a side-by-side -side comparison, just like the magazine, see all the features together. And then the best part about Captera kicks in because Captera has more than a million real-world reviews from real users. So you can, before you decide to buy, you can see what people who are actually using the software say about it. This is this is amazing. I think one of the reasons there are so many reviews is because Captera is free. It's there's no charge ever for this. It is a free directory, and I think people feel like, well, I want to pay it forward. I'm, I mean, this is great. So you do, you, and you're more than welcome. Leave a review. It really helps make Captera the leading free online resource for software solutions. Captera believes every business can thrive with the right software. You deserve it. There's lots of other information there, helpful articles, guidebooks, step-by-step ebooks. It's all free. Captera, C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A.com slash twit. It helped us find a perfect sales system. Captera is the solution. Captera.com slash twit. Find the tools to make an informed software decision for your business. It's free. Did I say it's free? It's free. Captera. Software selection simplified. Thank you, Captera, for supporting our shows. And thank you for supporting us by going to that special address, captera.com slash twit. We got a brand new show coming to the network. Actually, we're, we're launching a bunch of shows this year. But I thought we'd show you a little bit of the new show that Micah Sargent's putting together. Watch. So you got an Apple TV or an iPhone or an iPad or any number of iOS, iPad OS, TV OS, watch OS devices, and now you want to get the best out of them. Well, that's what I'm here to help you with. You've got questions, you got apps you want to try out, you want to learn some secrets, some tips and tricks. That's what this show is all about. It's hands on iOS and I'm so pumped to guide you through getting the most out of your iOS devices. So. If you want to check out the show, go ahead and click subscribe. You can do so in Apple Podcasts, Pocket Casts, or whatever podcast application you use. And if you want to check it out, just head to twit.tv slash HOI to learn more. One of a, a whole slate of HO shows we're going to do, hands-on shows. I'm going to be doing a Mac show. Uh, I've, they've promised they will let me do a Linux show. <laughs> <laughs> I begged, I begged them, please let me do a Linux show. So uh, I think these are going to be great. Nice short bits that help you with little tips and tricks. Uh, we, uh, watch it, twit.tv slash HOI. So here's my theory, and this has to do a little bit with the iPad. It's clear that what's happening with computing is it's going from a big, powerful computer in the middle. In the earliest days, it was a, a mainframe with dumb terminals at the end, but then it's slowly spreading out to the edge. Then you had a desktop PC. Now that's the big dumb computer in the middle, and it's moving out to the edge again with your phone, with IoT devices. Computing power, has uh, chips, memory, software has gotten so cheap that you can put a computer in your light bulb now. And so uh, this is what uh, Satya Nadella is calling computing at the edge. <clears throat> and it strikes me that that's what we're seeing. The reason the iPad is maybe... Uh, a little frustrating for some people is it's more of an edge device than a than a central device, but it's not quite as edge device as the iPhone. It's kind of stuck in the middle. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense, Devendra? Yeah, I think it's kind of a transitionary device, and I can understand that frustration. Um, yeah, I, like I said, I've talked to a lot of people who use as their primary computing device. I could never do that. Yeah. And if I tried to do that, I feel like I would be very frustrated because the CMS we use at Engadget is nearly 20 years old at this point. Like using stuff like that, like ugly old web See, tech, you're stuck with that great. old stuff. Yeah, like I was yeah. just talking about. Yeah. But we need, I, I think we still need people doing productivity work, uh, still need like traditional computers. There's nothing wrong I think with a traditional computer and you look at laptops over the past couple of years, over the last year, honestly, like laptops look incredible now. They're so sleek. They can do a lot more. Sure, you're still using a keyboard and mouse and dealing with older interfaces. But I think what you can actually do with those machines is a lot more than you could in the past. And yeah, that means the iPad being more of a consumption device, maybe not as much of a creativity device. I think that's still useful. But Microsoft, like their dual screen stuff, I'm really intrigued by that. Oh, yeah. The Duo and the Neo. Yes. I can't wait to see yeah. those end of the year. 
I think mm -hmm. we're going to see more and more of uh, of this. And, of course, Satya Nadella talks about it because they eventually their business model is Azure, the centralized mm -hmm. data and services that they want to offer. And they, that's why they don't care so much about Windows anymore. Sure. I mean, <clears> game <throat> consoles are computing now. If you're, yeah. if you're playing games in your living room, but now you can also, you know, stream your game and what you're playing and broadcast from that to to Mixer or Twitch or something. Right. So what you could do with your computer is a lot different now. Um, you could you could do computing related stuff pretty much anywhere all across your home. And I don't know, like uh, to me, I would love to see a dual screen device like I've tested out a couple of those laptops with two separate screens like the Asus uh, Zenbook Pro Duo. And that thing works really well like it's a big 12 inch screen right below the main screen and there's a lot you can do with that they just showed off a new one the zenbook duo i think at ces and that one's like three pounds a lot sleeker that sort of stuff i think will really extend the functionality of what you can expect from a pc too like things are transforming all around us i do see though <laughs> a lot of i mean i'm i'm more interested in the, in the duo with two screens and a hinge it's beautiful and, and yeah. maybe the zenbook uh duo which is kind of an interesting idea than I am in a bendy screen. And uh, Samsung, mm -hmm. of course, with the Fold, and we've seen other companies, uh, at CES, we saw a number of folding screens. And, of course, in nine days, Samsung is reportedly going to announce a competitor to the Nokia folding uh, phone, uh, a flip phone with a bendy screen. I thought it was – Has have you tried the, the new Nokia? I haven't tried the Nokia, but I've definitely seen enough of the bendy screen phones, especially like the Galaxy Fold. Uh, I am. I, I wrote a thing about this. I think last year after the Microsoft stuff debuted, like I, I think that split screen design is going to be a lot more functional and a lot more sturdy and useful for actual, you know, daily use than a folding screen. I, I feel like we'll get there eventually, but folding screens today are so precarious. It is insane what these companies are expecting these phones to do, and they're all going to have, you know, uh, bumps, wrinkles, yeah. creases, and they're going to break. They're going <laughs> to break so easily. Yeah, it's insane. I, I don't think did, we should be going down that road right now. Did you guys, uh, Leo or whoever, when you were at CES, did you see the Huawei ones? Like, yeah, those, they're beautiful. That, yeah, yeah, and I know, given <laughs> the the environment I was in, you better not buy it everything. because you know it's Chinese yeah. spyware. Yeah, but by the way, that was like, oh my god, this is really sexy. I and, think they and, got it done right. Yeah, that's the tri. Yeah. It's a trifold. One of the problems with the fold is it folds up into a phone you don't want. It's too mm -hmm. it's too small. Yeah. It's dopey, uh, and then it, then it unfolds, and then the creases are a problem. I'm interested in the duo because the idea of a duo is uh, the so the duo is Android and the Neo is Windows, right? Am I am I getting those two right? I believe so. Some, it's, I or uh, or vice versa. Vice versa. <laughs> one of them. <laughs> anyway, the idea is that you might have controls on one side and uh, and something else on the other. Do people uh, uh, work that way? Is that is that sensible or because the idea is, of the like, fold is it's just a bigger mm -hmm. screen. It's like, well, it's now it's an iPad. Screen. Yeah. But, but Microsoft's saying, way, well, you divide your functionality up among two screens. The way a lot of us work in Windows and on PCs is like you may have apps side by side or at least apps like maybe part of one window over here that you can keep an eye on the live stream or something while you work on your email over there. And that sort of functionality we have never really had in a mobile device. So that's what I'm really interested in is seeing like how – what we can do with that sort of functionality or have one app take up both screens, but have like your, you know, email folders or, uh, and categories on one side and all your messages on the other. I, it opens up the way we work, I, I think, in really new ways. So I'm excited. I'm not sure if they're going to pull this off. And I've learned not to get too excited about some Microsoft hardware. So we'll we'll see. Yeah. You know, or a even 100 100 percent. Uh, Twitter, like if I could have Twitter on some device scrolling like uh, they have uh, the, the stock ticker on CNBC or whatever, yeah, like, yep. yeah, yeah. I, I know I know that we're a different kind of users, but just something like that or anything that you can think of where it's like, I need this as a feed. So you, um, you too would prefer multiple screens to a single folding screen. I mean, I'm looking at I, this. This Mate is very. This is the Huawei Mate X. This is very attractive, but yeah, I worry yeah. about the durability of that. Leo, do you can you find the most recent leaked videos of the Galaxy Z Flip? Yeah, this is this is kind of like the. Um, I think yeah, let, yeah, I'll find it for you. This is kind of like yeah, the, it's uh, on the verge. The Nokia, right? Mm -hmm. um, Except for the fact that this. So what? Supposedly and this will be Samsung, supposedly announced uh, in, in nine days on the eleventh. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So it uh, folds up into a small square device, 
But then if you look at the video, it full it unfolds really, really tall. It's I know that I'm just the idea is Go ahead. it's it's like a pocket square when it's folded yes. up. It's it's yes. smaller than a phone. It opens up into a phone size, not a big screen. It opens up to a phone size. You like this idea. Well, no, actually, I know we're jumping around here, <laughs> but I I thought that this is too tall. So one of the things that I like about the concept, and we've jumped from laptops to uh, smartphones, so forgive me. The thing that I like about no, but the that's, concept... No, no, this is all ahead. of a piece because this is all about computing on the edge. This mm -hmm, is all mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. smaller, different computing devices that might in the long run, replace regular computers. So one of the things that I like about the concept of foldables on phones is that the real estate in my pocket uh, can be reduced, yep. right? Yep. So my ideal phone would be a phone that could get back to, you know, there is a, a, a foldable razor coming out, but get back to the, you fold it up and it's smaller size like the old razors used to be. You unfold it and you can have a phablet. I would love a phablet. It's just that I don't want to have to carry around a phablet. So, like, that's the sweet spot that I'm hoping at. I, I don't know that I'm sold on foldables for, for phones, but if someone could give me a phablet when I want it and, and a, a, a smaller phone in my pocket, that's what I want. Here's the, uh, the, the leaked Twitter video. I, is, it, is this shaky uh, the way it's supposed to be? It's very shaky. So you see that the phone itself is a, is a tiny little phone. There's only a little screen that's kind of notification screen, and then it opens up. Uh, you know, notice how he opened it with his fingers all over it. I, that just seems to me that we're going to have a big problem <laughs> in about two months mm -hmm. with these phones just breaking. I don't know if I trust these flexible uh, screens very much. I, I think what's happening, by the way, is that you look at a folding phone, it's like, oh, man, that's so cool. That's the future. Yeah. That's the future I want. I want a single yeah. screen that can do this. This is yeah. what I've seen in sci-fi. I think realistically, in terms of what we can build now, um, the dual separate screen you know, idea just makes a lot more sense. And we don't talk about hinges as much, you know, because it's not as sexy as a folding screen. But laptop companies, Microsoft, Lenovo, a lot of folks have been building these convertible laptops over the past decade, basically, and really perfecting their hinge tech. And I think that, that is really reliable. Um, it's really sturdy and it can take a lot more abuse than a folding screen can. So that's that's my big thing for these dual screen devices like the Duo and the Neo just are really intriguing from that respect. Expensive, right? Well, yeah, we don't know anything yet. The but. Razor is fifteen hundred bucks. Yeah, <clears throat> and it even said in the uh, apparently I didn't see it, but because uh, I didn't buy it, but uh, it says in the in the uh, instructions, it, it's to be expected that you'll have some bumps and ripples <laughs> on the screen. It's like uh, I don't want that. They're gonna have to sell phone irons for these things. Yeah, that's it's like not you what flatten you want. it. Yeah. <laughs> But if they could perfect the folding screen, I guess I would be okay with it. So that's so that's one approach, which is uh, to make it a smaller phone that turns into a normal size phone. Uh, there's Jeffrey Fowler uh, from the uh, Washington Post talking about it. Or uh, what? And Samsung's doing both. So Samsung is going to have a small phone that unfolds, apparently the Z Flip, and they're going to have a uh, Galaxy Fold style eight inch screen that unfolds. Which would you prefer, or would you want both? I think this is all about, I think it's, this is why, to me, the edge is interesting. It's choice. <clears throat> and the, the problem is if you can only choose one, that makes it hard, because one doesn't yep. do everything. But if you could afford to have, a, so uh, like a lot of computing is going to be going through my Amazon Echo or my Google Home Max, or maybe my folding phone, or maybe my folding tablet, or maybe my laptop. The, the computing is going to be environmental, ambient, well, and it's going to be well, with whatever the, device is appropriate. Leo, just just for, again, coming back to smartphones, like you, you said choice. Like we've only had one choice for 10 years now, which is a slab of glass yeah. out mm -hmm. of yeah. 2001 A Space Odyssey, right? So I don't care. Like what if... You know, again, cars and trucks and things like you have a, a choice. Like, I would love ten years from now for there to be three to five different 
form factors for devices. And and it's not even for use cases. It's also for like personal preference and taste and things like that. Like that's more interesting to me than everybody has a thing that looks exactly the same. So even though I get pushback on this, like no one's buying those foldable phones or whatever. I'm like, but I like the fact that people are trying to find something mm -hmm. else, you know. But isn't that what we learned from Apple's results and Facebook's results? We're in a mass, 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 mass market <laughs> where everybody's just using iPhones and AirPod Pros and Facebook and uh, I, I would love to see a thousand flowers bloom. For sure, for sure. This all just Everybody seems has too to... new. Still, is that it? It's just, it's just not perfect. Oh, just like three, just like three D and TV. I yeah. think people aren't ready for it. It's, it's going to be <laughs> imperfect, and I think it's going to cast a stain on the whole foldables right. for years to come. Right. Because some people got sick from three D. It's the same thing with these foldables. Someone says, "Oh, I bought one of those." cost me more money than any other phone and then it broke after eight months because the screen had a crease in it yeah well and the tv um, thing I, is I, interesting because they they just died the 3d trend died because the tv makers had like the 4k and hdr ended up being the better upsell to people rather than wear these ugly glasses and maybe you'll get 3d that looks as good as the theater it never did and that was the big problem yeah, sci-fi ruins everything by having yep. people's expectations set so high that when it finally comes, it's like, oh, this is not the, what. Damn this you, is not my flying car. Damn mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Uh, Samsung spent years and millions, maybe billions of dollars developing flexible screens. They had it to themselves, but apparently it leaked out, and all of a sudden, a bunch of other companies had the technology. Mm-hmm. Whether is was, that what happened? Like yeah. I'm sure LG, because LG also like they're the main OLED company too. So they've been the the LG display side of things is always like showing off these new innovations. Like at CES this year, they had the the TV that was rolling down from the ceiling, which is not something they're going to be selling anytime soon. But next year, it could be in a TV. <laughs> Last set, year, so. they had the TV yeah. rolling up from the and floor. They never sold it. Yeah, and <laughs> now they have it rolling. Big improvement down from the ceiling. <laughs> From the ceiling, which honestly is a much more useful way of installing that stuff. But yeah, the the box, the folding up TV, they didn't actually get to sell last year, so that'll sell this year. They're not selling the drop down one. That's just it's like a really prototype right now. It's expensive too. It's so expensive, but it's ridiculous. I'm, I think a lot of companies have been pursuing foldable, rollable tech and displays. That's motivated and OLEDs, like that by a completely yeah. different uh, thinking, which is I don't have a TV. <laughs> There's look at my living room. There's no TV. I'm not a TV watcher. And then as soon as you leave, it rolls up and you watch your TV. <laughs> That's Just totally you're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to pretend you don't watch TV. <laughs> Projectors are so much easier. Just, just get a projector. <laughs> yeah. Just come on. Hide the projector. I am proud that I watch a lot of TV. Apple I, I didn't mention this in the Apple results, but Apple's talking about Apple TV Plus. And I think it was Luca Maestri, their uh, their CFO, said, "Yeah, the results from Apple TV Plus are immaterial." <laughs> <laughs> In other words, we didn't. It doesn't. We didn't. <laughs> it'll it'll be material if they buy James Bond. I think. Uh, is there a rumor uh, is that they might be buying MGM? I can't. Wow. I don't think Apple will buy MGM. We won't know until like next year, basically, what all this means. Yeah. yeah. Did you? I mean, D uh, Devendra does a mm -hmm. wonderful podcast slash film, and a, and Thank a you. great blog and i presume you've talked about the apple tv plus shows oh, we have were there we have, any I've, hits there i mean people really like uh, the morning show i didn't <sighs> to me it felt like an aaron oh, sorkin yeah. light like an, an imitation of an aaron they couldn't sorkin get show, aaron so that's what they did they couldn't uh i, re I really like dickinson the emily <laughs> like really interesting vibrant emily dickinson i have to watch uh, that biopic show it's yeah. it's a lot of fun because it's like the kids talk like kids today there's right. a lot of modern music in it but it's also set in the social norms of her day so that that's all kind of fascinating i feel like, I like they missed yeah. they missed a little bit they didn't they didn't get what they needed which was a game of thrones or a stranger things they didn't get they tried. the breakout yeah. they so, tried basically to copy every sort of faint with like popular tv style so the morning show is their aaron sorkin right. um the what servant? the servant <clears throat> is is like a thriller i actually really like servant because it's a uh, produced by it. m night Shyamalan. i liked it to the last episode and then i was like kind of pissed yeah. off i need i need more i need more yeah. but they have uh yeah they have a, a game of thrones kind of ripoff show they have kids shows they have oprah 
you know, involved. It so must, they're really like trying to hit the popular it's, it's trends. It's got to frustrate Eddie Q, though, that they put a billion dollars into this. And then Netflix kind of comes up with this crappy show called The Witcher. And everybody's talking about it. Oh, well. I bet you I bet you Apple passed on The Witcher. I don't know. No, that, that's one of those things where, like, I'm sure Netflix, they know, first of all, that Henry Cavill is a much more bankable star than, you know, Superman. The, the Game of Thrones guy. He's Superman. He's, he's Superman. Also, Witcher is a popular series. And, like, it is, that that's a deeper discussion, I'd say. But I don't think Apple, a billion dollars, first of all, weird to say. Is not that much money no. compared to what Netflix spends, 17. what Disney spent on Disney Plus. Yeah. Apple will spend seven, I mean, Netflix will spend $17 billion this year on yes. content. One billion is nothing. You're punters, you're amateurs. <laughs> so, you know, they're, they're getting started. Henry I, I feel Cavill like alone got three of those $17 billion. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Him and his pecs, yeah. basically. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> People love that show. I, I mean, it's okay. <laughs> No, I, I think well, people love it because it's it's sort of like it has taken over the conversation, yeah. and that is that is a very specific thing. That's something HBO shows can do. Game of Thrones did that. Watchmen, I think, did that to a degree, although not everybody did that. I Watchmen liked is a Watchmen. perfect show, by the way. Boy, I liked Watchmen. I, so you know, I actually because I hadn't read the comic originally and I hadn't uh, seen the movie, I went out and I got the comic and I really spent time with mm -hmm. it. A lot of people I respect. People I thought were too smart to read comic books said it, it's like uh, one of the best novels of all time. It's great, yeah. It's like the Ulysses of of, <laughs> of comic of, books. Uh, <laughs> comic books, I'd like say, yeah. Yeah, well, maybe. Uh, <laughs> Keep in mind for Apple Apple subscriptions, a lot of them were given away for free. That's right. With new iPhones, so Almost all it's going to be at least yeah mm -hmm. to see how. If, if it's actually catching on when people get a bill and they said, hey, do you want to pay this for another year and yeah. choose to opt into that? Yeah. Do you think that there's anything to be read into the fact that they could literally report nothing? Like, you know that if they could say anything, they would say anything something. at all. Yeah. 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 They won a Golden Globe. Actually, the the reviewers seem to think Little America is the is the actual it's not going to be a breakout hit, but it's really good. Critical. It's really good. Critically, the success of the bunch. Mm -hmm. I haven't watched that yet either. That's this is the one that uh, was created by um, the big sick folks. The, yeah, the big yeah. sick folks. Camille Nanjiani and That's Emily it, Gordon. Camille Nanjiani. Yeah. Emily Gordon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's about immigration, so it's timely topic. Immigrants in America. That is something near and dear to my heart. It is. It's such a beautiful show. I wish it were longer. I think that's my only complaint about make, these things because they're telling epic stories in like half an hour, yeah, and I need more. They're going to make a um, podcast too. Mm -hmm. So it, I think that might be the surprise hit of the uh, group. Let's take a little break. Great panel they, here. Devendra what, Hardawar from Engadget. I'm sorry, Brian, did I cut you off? It wasn't me. No, I was going to say it would be nice <laughs> if Apple TV uh, did the thing that they did with Picard and put like each of the shows for free uh, every once in a while and rotate that. So that they, you get Some of them are free on iTunes. Like you can watch the first if, episode. I'm sometimes. not an Apple yeah. person. So like yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't first use iTunes. Episode, yeah. I need it to be on YouTube for yeah. it to to someone outside of their target audience. That was a good move with Picard, right? Give away the first one on YouTube. And then I think if you would get Pluto TV, does Pluto have the whole thing? Maybe just the first episode. Well, I, I haven't Philo seen it. Has it. Not Who Pluto. does? Philo. Philo. Not Pluto. I could, flu I could fuse Fubo, Philo, and Pluto. <laughs> I wonder why. Fubar. Yeah. Fubar. Our sh Devinder Ottawa is here, senior editor of Engadget, Wesley Faulkner, brand new developer relations guy at MongoDB. Uh, always a pleasure to see you, Wesley. I hope we go to South by this year. I'd like to get together, have another barbecue. Oh, yeah, sandwich definitely. Love beer. to see you. Yeah. And uh, from the Tech Meme ride home, Brian McCullough, internet historian, a daily tech news show. Ooh, that's crazy talk, Brian. Listen, every time you say that, I have not gone to school for history. I am not a PhD. <laughs> that doesn't matter. What? No one's a PhD I, in internet history. Right. I'm just the guy that has been in the internet uh, for 20 years, and I wrote about stuff I remember. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a professional podcaster now. Oh, yeah. You, know? you keep saying that. You think that there's more status being a professional podcast than an amateur? No, no, but you know, <laughs> the book did well. We 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 Trust earned me. back advance all that stuff. I make my living. I On pay my podcasting. podcasting. That's right, and he's That's proud of it. Mighty proud Absolutely. of it. You and me both, buddy. 
Uh, our show today brought to you by Wasabi. I was just talking to Chris uh, Marquardt, our photo guy, about his backup strategy. He surprised me. He uses Wasabi as his cloud storage. You know, you might be surprised by the people who use Wasabi. Wasabi is hot cloud storage. Maybe you've not heard of the name, but you might want to think about Wasabi for yourself because it is faster, better, less expensive, more reliable than the big guys. It blows away Google and Microsoft. Wasabi, I'll give you an example. Wasabi uses the Amazon S3 API, but never charges for API requests. They don't even charge for egress. Wasabi, because they came up with a revolutionary process that lays data on disks sequentially, as opposed to in blocks, is 80% cheaper than S3 and six times faster. And man, talk about security. There's my buddy, David Friend. Hey, David. We love David Friend. He created Wasabi with his uh, partner, Jeff Flowers. You get 11 nines of durability. 11 nines. I would, I would willing to bet that it's more secure than your on-premises storage. If you're, like many of us, looking at cloud for your business, you've got to look at Wasabi. Uh, you can make some storage immutable. That means it cannot be changed by ransomware. That's huge these days. Data center redundancy means your data is always safe. They even do active integrity checking on every single file to make sure you lose not one bit. That's how you get 11 nines of durability. HIPAA compliant, FINRA compliant, CJIS compliant. Talk about savings. Just take a look. Go to wasabi.com, W-A-S-A-B-I.com. I think if you're presenting to the boss a cloud storage strategy, yeah, I know you're. I know you're going to do Azure, and you're going to do Google Cloud, and you're going to do AWS. But I really think you ought to look at Wasabi. Add a fourth name to that, Wasabi. In fact, if you want to try it for yourself, we've got an unlimited month. Just bang on it. Upload everything. Uh, click the free trial link at Wasabi.com. Use the offer code TWIT for a month's unlimited use, so you can really see for yourself. I'm telling you, it is the best. Join the movement. Migrate your data to the cloud, but do it with confidence with Wasabi. W-A-S-A-B-I dot com. Make sure you use the offer code TWIT. Everybody needs storage. Everybody needs Wasabi. Wasabi dot com. Offer code TWIT. Thank you, Wasabi, for uh, supporting the show. Uh, good old Agit Pai. <laughs> good old Agit Pai. He's been busy. FCC's been busy. They finally admitted one year after Motherboard and the New York Times revealed that certain carriers, certain mobile phone companies were selling your data to people like bounty hunters. One year, the FCC finally says, oh, <laughs> you know what? <laughs> They're selling your data. Uh, Ajit Pai has, says, we've concluded. i got to read you the quote because it's, it's hysterical. We concluded that one or more carriers... One or more, we're not going to say how many, broke the law selling location data. Uh, he wrote a, a, a letter to uh, Frank Pallone, who's a member of the House. I wish to inform you, says Ajit Pai, the FCC's Enforcement Bureau has completed its extensive investigation and has concluded that one or more wireless carriers apparently violated federal law. Apparently. Uh, we'll see. Appar we'll see. Uh, in the coming days, Pi writes, I intend to circulate to my fellow commissioners for their consideration one or more notices of apparent liability for for forfeiture in connection with the apparent violations. That's three apparents <laughs> in one letter. That's eh, good. Uh, as uh, Vice Motherboard, which discovered this a year ago, points out, Pi's been foot dragging and stonewalling through much of the last year. Uh, other commissioners like uh, Democrat Jessica Rosenworcel, who was often in opposition to the Republican chairman, Ajit Pai, said that for more than a year, the FCC was silent. This is an FCC commissioner speaking. After news reports alerted us that for just a few hundred dollars, shady middlemen could sell your location within a few hundred meters based on your wireless phone data. It's chilling to consider what the black market could do with this data. It puts the safety and privacy of every American with a wireless phone at risk. Commissioner Jeffrey Starks, wrote an editorial for the New York Times criticizing lack of follow-through. 
I'm glad he wrote, we may finally act on these egregious allegations. My question is, what took so long? And of course, this doesn't say they're going to enforce it. It just says, we're looking into it. And it doesn't say what the fines will be. It says, we're looking into it. It's apparently. Yeah, finally uh, act in quotes. Yeah, quote. And you know what will uh, you know, happen. They'll do a slap on the wrist. And uh, yep. these companies, which make tons of money on this stuff, will pay a small pittance for the right to keep on doing it effectively or to have done it for the past year. Anyway, I guess we mm -hmm. should mention they're going to do something about it, maybe. Apparently. Maybe. Apparently. Yeah. I'm really and interested even if they're to see fine. where... Go, go, ahead, uh, go, ahead, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. You, Wesley, and then, and then yep. we'll give it... Uh, uh, in terms of telecoms and fines, uh, there might be a fine, but there's very little enforcement to make sure those fines are paid. Uh, so even if they were oh, told, that, hey, you need to pay X amount of dollars, they could say, sure, and then never pay the fine and it never get enforced that, that they're not getting paid yeah i'm sorry if i'm skeptical <laughs> i apologize i think yeah the fcc has historically never been one to press these companies too hard and i, I don't think gadget pie is also the guy to do it like i'm really interested to see like which consulting firm or lobby group he joins well it's a once, revolving you know, door he was a verizon he was a verizon yeah. lobbyist right yeah it's always been a revolving door for this job it's too bad mm-hmm into and out of private, the private sector. Uh, Facebook this week put out a, as Gizmodo called it, confusing off Facebook activity privacy tool. They also says it doesn't do poop. <laughs> doesn't clear it's nothing. <laughs> um, have any of you played with the activity tool? I mean, the one thing it does do, I, I am not a Facebook uh, user, I so I can't look at it. But what apparently... Yeah, I did... Sorry, I did too because I kind of had to walk it back. Like the day it came out, I talked about I used it. I talked about it. I was like, oh, wow, this is actually – this is refreshing. I can see all these things and um, I can uh, case by case say not you, not you, not you. And I was like, wow, all right. Th this is actually um, – it's late because remember this was supposed to happen a long time ago. and what, But it was – of all the things where it's like, well, we're giving you granular control over how your data. I was like, wow, it's very intuitive. And then I learned subsequently that it's basically bupkis. It doesn't, it doesn't do anything. <laughs> so I guess the value is you see what the connections are. There's lots of them, I take it. Well, but the, the point is, is that all it does is sever the connection. Right. So that um, the third parties have the data on you. Facebook has the data on you. And when you say, I don't want you to share this anymore, it just severs the connection. But it's not deleting. On and either so, side. Yeah. Right. But everybody still has the data. So then it's... Mm, Does it stop yeah. it from doing it going forward? Or or will, as inevitably happens, you know, I uh, with Twitter, Facebook, and these others, I would typically every year or so go, oh, yeah, I should probably delete my application connections and all that. Go through them, Google... Uh, is it like that, that then you'll just start making more of them? We'll see. Uh, that I, I, Actually, I haven't followed up on that, so I don't know. But the point being that, in theory, the way that I remember using it is that so then if I go back to another website and make the connection again. Yeah, that it starts it's, up. It's, the, Right. So uh, it, it, it maybe puts the onus on me to always go in. <laughs> so then if you think about it that way, it's useless because then it's requiring me to go in. Now, they're going to sell it as, well, we're giving you this control, but my control is that every time I have to think about, okay, it's another, it's the first of the month, I got to go into my Facebook and see if I can sever. And by the way, all I'm doing is severing for a certain amount of time, but it's not deleting anything. Shoshana Wodinsky, Wodinsky, who's writing at Gizmodo and says it doesn't do poop, <laughs> uh, writes, uh, Zuck's use of the phrase is control your off Facebook activity <clears throat> and clear this information from your account is misleading. You're not really controlling or clearing much of anything. You're just telling Facebook to put the data it has on you in two separate buckets that are otherwise mixed together. So you're 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 clearing the connection Facebook made between its data and the data it gets from third parties, but the data so face so the data is still stored at Facebook. They didn't delete anything. I don't even know if this is compliant with GDPR or the new California Privacy Act, because in both cases you're supposed to be able to find out what data a company keeps on you, and you're both you're supposed to be able to delete have them delete it, right? 
Well, that's what I'm going to say is that, again, I walked it back, but I was very impressed with like the transparency now. And I'm going to also walk back the fact that you had to go through this layer and this layer and this layer of settings and settings to find it. However, once I got there, I was like, wow, this was really easy to figure out this site that I remember visiting once six months ago. There's the amount of connections yeah. they have on me. And yeah. I was like, all right, stop. So you it's know? not useless. Yeah, uh, if you're willing to be very vigilant, I guess. Yeah. I this is why I'm not on Facebook. I don't feel like Facebook is completely transparent about what they're up to, what they're doing, and what they're giving you. Anybody disagree? <laughs> One thing is right. you are on Facebook, you just don't have a profile. That's that the real can... problem, yes. isn't it? Yes. I, I and now I can't see it. <laughs> I can't log yeah. into my Facebook account. So now I've got a, a, a what do they call them? A shadow dossier, but I have no idea what's in it because I don't have a Facebook account. Hey, and Leo, they do a when, lot of uh, things like this. Yeah, yeah. When when you delete, uh, can you are you able to say I want you to erase everything? Yes. When you cancel in, the account, in yes. Theory, that's what's happened. But I, okay. I I don't have absolute confidence that Facebook no longer. Knows but they're who telling I am. you that that's what happens. Yeah, I I believe that's the case. I believe mm. that's the case. Mm -hmm. uh, There's nobody holding them accountable. But I feel like Facebook tends to throw bread. You know, they throw breadcrumbs at things like this, and they hope it's enough to satisfy us. And to me, it's like, uh, didn't they also announce that this summer their their was it going to be their governing board or oh, the yeah uh, the Facebook oversight board? The oversight. Yeah, they're going to start hearing cases. Um, you know about content issues and i we don't know what that means because they're entirely in charge of it and yeah it, it's one of those things where it sounds like facebook is trying to do the right thing but they don't they don't ever you know want to let anyone else uh, kind of come in to really check out what's going on we need some independent oversight at some point so facebook's uh independent content oversight board according to cnbc Leaves the company firmly in control. Yeah. Uh, so the board will have the ability to review content moderation cases as long as they don't involve content posted on Facebook's marketplace, fundraisers, Facebook dating, WhatsApp, Messenger, Instagram Direct, or Oculus services. And, Facebook said, the board's decisions will not set precedent. So and maybe Facebook can pick the judges and they did. maybe can Well wait a yeah. minute no they picked the first round and then the, those judges picked the rest. I don't even know who's on the board at this point. I don't know if they've picked them yet. They're going to do it for 6 years. It will review the annual reports prepared by the trust to determine the operational and procedural effectiveness of the board. Of course after 6 years they could say oh, it, it didn't work. I bet they will. Facebook will implement board decisions to allow or remove the content properly brought to it for review within seven days of the release of the board's decision on how to action the content. I, you know what? This is, to me, a way to pass the buck. Yeah. So we don't have to decide. Uh, and obviously, uh, this board won't have the bandwidth to, to deal with all of the myriad content problems on Facebook. I mean, well, it's also you you set up you set up this regime in place to say that you have a regime in place, but then number 1, it's probably set up to not be functional for things that actually matter. And then number 2, if some outlier happens, you can always say that it's not well, mm -hmm. this isn't a part of the regime, right? right. So it's Facebook not applicable. decides which cases the oversight board exactly. reviews. Exactly. Exactly. So they could just say, "Well, we're not. This one's not for you." <laughs> well, right. We'll You're saying this. like this is this is not uh, judiciable or whatever. Right. <laughs> I don't know. You know, yeah, like that's this a good is word. not. Yeah, 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 yeah. It reminds me. It reminds me of when I was in middle school and and we had a a Star Trek uh, RPG on on Prodigy and we came up. I, I, you were scrolling down and I'm looking at the bylaws and like we wrote that sort of thing up where it's like, <laughs> well, you can't you can't do this against someone else on your ship and you can't and, and like like that's literally what they're doing. It's just pretend RPG sort of like bylaws. I, it's, it's they're not even doing that. I wish what they're doing <laughs> is they making a body. It's saying you will make the decisions, but you won't have to spell out what the laws are. Right. It's like saying we want you to be ethical, but not define what ethics is because it's, some person. It's kind of like creating totally a Supreme Court like philosophy. And then instead of letting the court decide what cases to take, you tell them what cases to take. And also There's like a the trolley car problem. 
if you, you could choose to hit the people or hit the one whoever and um, either choice is actually an ethical choice. But if you don't define what your ethics are, you can't predict oh, how things will be treated yeah. on a case by uh, going forward. Just flip and so the coin. them treating it from a case by case basis means that they never have to write down, they never have to mm. define what is truly right and what is truly wrong, what is ethical, what is not ethical. Or there's another term for it, which is uh, banana republic, where uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're not talking about the place I could get my genes. You're talking about the the countries in South America that are secretly run by the Dole Pineapple Company, or that uh, you know, yeah, the judges are, are who, your, your best friends. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they did announce the first member of the board. It'll be Thomas Hughes, former executive director of a human rights organization called Article 19. He'll be the director. Facebook says it plans to announce board members and trustees in the coming months. That would be a horrible job, but I'll, you know, I'll do it if if you really need me, Mark. I'm here. I think I saw that a, a, a bunch of people that they were um, proposing for the board were like, "Yeah, not me. I, I <laughs> no, don't want to do right. this." That's, yeah. that's exactly right. I think we already have heard some from some people. Uh, mm -hmm. um, let's see. How about a vast? How about that? A vast, which uh, for years people preferred as uh, an antivirus because they didn't have to pay any money. Turns out they were doing more than paying money. <laughs> a vast bought a company, uh, a marketing company, that uh, they sent jump shot. They sent all the information that they collected, and they collected a lot from people using Avast to jump shot, which then sold it to marketers, brands, and so forth. So much heat now that Avast is actually shutting down Jump yeah. Shot. We probably should have been queued off by the name Avast, which... <laughs> well, that... It's a pirate. It's like Avast, it's a pirate me, term. Me, Come on. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Avast, me, mateys. I want to know where you've been and what you're doing. Uh, they're going to turn it, terminate it and uh, wind it down. Um, by the way, JumpShot described itself in marketing materials as the only company that unlocks walled garden data to provide marketers with unparalleled visibility, analytical insights, and more comprehensive understanding of the online customer journey that delivers a highly competitive advantage. Mm, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. No, the, 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 the key quote there was the, the one where they said that it was like um, almost like an Apache log for the entire internet <laughs> for every device do. in the panel. Yeah. Every, every, every site you go to, your geographic locations, uh, and on and on and on. And again, you guys the know this better than me. Like It's because it's, a, it's an antivirus thing, so it has access to way right. deeper layers right. of your computer than a they lot of other They had a, a browser plug-in, but that was the least of it. It wasn't just watching your browsing. It was they also they got in trouble for the browser plug-in because that was also right. taking in too much data. So, right, right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, by the way, le lessons from this. Uh, don't trust free software <laughs> that is claiming to do yeah. you know a ton of great stuff. And also maybe... I, I'm gonna say it. I don't. I don't think many people need antivirus software these days. <laughs> no, like, I tell people that all the don't. time. The last thing you want. Hey, let you me say, ask you about you know. this. I have never heard of this. Somebody was talking in the chat room about MeWe, MeWe.com, a Facebook alternative that says no ads, no spyware, no BS. Has anybody ever heard of this? Because the reason I ask is. Well, if they don't have ads or spyware and it's free, who's paying for this? Mm -hmm. Shouldn't this always be the question when you see something that's free? Uh, well, okay, so you're the product. Yeah, wh yeah. Why? Why? How can they give this away and not have any ads? Free forever, yeah. it says. Free forever. No ads. No spyware. Free forever. Is this just some billionaire that's giving it away? Because that's the only way I could see this would work. Yeah. Or like a Craigslist type thing where it's just like, hey, somebody running it uh, basically without the goal of making a ton of profit. I haven't heard anything about this company, but it is. This to me seems like if you're going to do a social network like this, right? Like maybe you'd expect people to pay something a little like the way WhatsApp had like a nominal fee. Yeah. Just 99 cents a year. year. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, is I like NSA running this. Part, yeah. yeah. Well, maybe, maybe there is. Yeah, I don't know. It got it was a, 
Uh, it's been around for a few years. I mean, I, I'm not. I don't know. I don't. I'm not blasting them. I think it'd be great to have a Facebook alternative. But uh, I no, just, you. Because I, I heard that when you when I came in uh, this afternoon, and it was just someone randomly on the. Yeah, the, they were saying that. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna leave that Facebook for that or whatever. Look, I mean, number one. Um, it's like the whole Google thing. Like, well, what if you just did a, a a search engine that only had two ads or something like that? Like, in theory, you could always do a social network that didn't sell your data or whatever and just ran banner ads or whatever. You could probably still make a billion dollars a year if you could get traction. But um, I've never heard of it. So, <laughs> so I don't know. That's a often a question that comes up is, does tracking make advertising more effective at all anyway? I mean, there's so much debate about that yeah. right now. Mm -hmm. I understand Especially, why advertisers think it does. No, but that's the. This is we could do an hour on this, like because there's been a lot of smart pieces about this recently. About even you know we've said for years that Google is the greatest advertising engine ever created because they're at the point of intention. If you search for a hotel in Marietta, Georgia, it's likely that you're going to um, want to go to Marietta, Georgia uh, in the near future. And so like, it, it, but at the same time, like there's been all these studies that say that like, you know, eBay and, and even all of the, in fact, that like the last decade of unicorns and stuff like that, they throw these, they throw their money at these targeted ads targeted and 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 the idea is is well wouldn't those have been searches anyway wouldn't those have been like so that if if it it's almost like the banner ad which used to be like this shotgun approach like it, or or even there's that famous quote like i don't know um uh i i spend all this money on advertising and half of it is wasted i just don't know what ha what half right um, a lot of people are now thinking that maybe 30% is wasted. We just don't know what 30%. So like that's the, that's it, it, that's the progress we've made. I worry because ad tech kind of ruined the internet. And I, I, I worry that if av advertisers are demanding this, I worry it's going to ruin podcasting. I mean, it's the next frontier in podcasting is figuring out how to track our audience and uh, already, I mentioned this before, but already Spotify has announced, yeah, we're gonna mm -hmm. have, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna have all sorts of metrics about our uh, our listeners. So come come buy ads on the Spotify podcasts. Yeah, but Pod Spotify can do that because they own an app that right. Um, they force that, that, you to use Spotify, and then Spotify spies on you, and they sell that information to the advertiser. And and theoretically, they're using an RSS feed, but they're kind of not. Like that's a whole other inside baseball podcasting thing. But um, I well, don't know. I just like, wonder. I mean, are you not getting pressure on you from advertisers to? Hey, yeah, we'd like to know more about your tech meme ride home audience. There is there there is the ability to put like um, what's the term? I can't think Tracking of it right now. Pixel. But, uh, right, right, exactly. Um, um, uh, again, I can't remember the term, but. Um, However, in theory, like that's still there's several degrees removed as opposed to Spotify, where Spotify, like when I look on my stats at Spotify, not only can I see the everything. age, the, the demo, everything, I can see the top five artists of the people that listen to my podcast. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's a completely different thing than say Overcast or even um, Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or anything. It's like, like where it's just basically an RSS feed. And unless I put a pixel thing on there, like all I know is this episode got downloaded and maybe from this IP address so that you can figure out it's in this geographic region and that sort of thing. Uh, Elon Musk dancing at the announcement of the Model Y. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Have you seen it? No. <laughs> yes. It's awkward. It's as, <laughs> it's as awkward as his uh, music that he released. His music is very awkward. Um, so it's on brand. <laughs> here is Elon uh, Musk dancing uh, at the... Uh, actually, this is the Model 3 delivery ceremony but i thought it was the model y ceremony on the other hand <laughs> this checks out yeah. <laughs> i just like i enjoy it if you haven't seen it's the like, video it's, it's polka meets something else i don't know what it is yeah. uh i read a good the article poor woman next to him is like i don't know <laughs> she's how to not react she's to like uh sir uh please stop please, please stop. stop it's not 
it's, this is Narby. He doesn't. He won't stop. In fact, at some point, he takes off his jacket and doubles down uh, on it. Um, any, any, <laughs> anyway, I don't. I, I, uh, as a former Tesla owner, I like Elon Musk. He's, he seems like. Oh, now he's really. Wait a minute. Now he's. Oh my God, he's getting. He's given the woman his microphone. He's taking off his jacket. Oh, man. He's throwing it in. <laughs> oh God, this is. This is, I once danced with Bill Gates. It was better than this. <laughs> better Leo, than this. Are you aware of the fact that theoretically he released a song on SoundCloud early you want, Friday morning? Do you want to hear it? Okay. I, not only am I aware of it, I, I, have, I have the song. <laughs> Elon Musk says the register shows the world he's truly awful at something. Uh, he's followed up his feel-good hit of 2019, R.I.P. Harimbe, with Don't Doubt Your Vibe. You ready, everybody? Don't, don't doubt your vibe. Elon uh, wrote the lyrics and performed the vocals. Grimes left him in the studio for way too long and he got bored. Apparently Grimes is pregnant. Is that with Elon's baby? Supposedly. Oh, my God. So I was about to praise. I came not to bury <laughs> Elon, but to praise him. Uh, because I like a very, I'm one of the onlys who's very excited about Starlink. We were talking about, there he is making the song. He's doing the dance. It's the same dance. I uh, think Starlink is the greatest thing ever because we were talking about computing at the edge. What do you need if you're going to compute at the edge? You need internet everywhere, every single yeah. place you go. Uh, Except that's going to ruin life for a lot of astronomers. Amateur apparently. astronomers. Big freaking deal. Sorry, <laughs> d dudes. Deal with it. Buy deal a telescope it. in space. You, <laughs> that's, from, oh. from Elon Musk in a couple of years. Elon probably. will have that too. Yeah. So this is a great piece from Jeffrey Paul who is a hacker and security researcher in Berlin, uh, talking about... A nice transition, by the way. Thank you, Kevin. He's talking about uh, what Starlink's going to do. Imagine adding internet access to the rest of the other half of the world. Only half the world has internet now. Imagine putting those other 3 billion people online and what the effect of that will be. Um, that's what, to me, is fascinating. And we're going to start seeing Starlink... This year, we're going to start, and it will get better every year as he launches more and more and more, up to 12,000 lower. More space orbits. junk. More yeah. space junk. So who wants to argue against, so Elon, dance, music, Starlink. One, I, you know, one, he, he's a smart guy. He's an interesting guy. I feel like I've lost a lot of respect for him after the uh, the whole time, the diver story. Yeah, yeah and like that, that was cool. Like it is... He is, cool. yeah, he's an interesting figure, but he is so, like, unchecked in his madness and nobody can tell him no anymore. So, yeah, let yeah. him make his bad techno music and let him dance Elon, and make himself maybe insane. you should doubt your vibe. Maybe. Maybe you should. Maybe you should. Well, also, he One thing about created... The, go ahead, Wesley, and then... Ahead, uh, yeah, and, Wesley, Wesley. So the Starlink is going to have super, super fast access, faster than um, you can get from a hard cable from London to New York. Yep. So a lot of the initial uh, customers for Starlink are probably going to be for financial trades mm -hmm. uh, to major mm -hmm. uh, financial hubs, mm -hmm. uh, which means that it's going to be super expensive for oh. the very, very oh. latency sensitive applications. That being said, that means it's going to be high end initially. Um, and that's um, fun. He's got to make that money of, back. It's expensive to launch 12,000 satellites. <laughs> right? And when you think about th that being like, it's a high end for inter uh, form of internet. So people can go wherever they want and not be disconnected. Um, uh, one concern is that, uh, SpaceX also Starlink is a U.S. company and, um, what is it going to be like for the U.S. government to be able to tap into some of the oh. most important, richest transactions, communications uh, around the world uh, with a subpoena? Um, so as more people and more high value targets move onto this platform, um, it, it's going to be really curious as to how many people will trust it. 
uh, knowing that the U.S. government can just tap into it. Um, I don't know if he can find a way of incorporating it into a place where he doesn't have to um, have to, to submit to these types of uh, law authorities, whether it's Russia, whether it's China, whether it's the U.S. government, to try to move away from that kind of oversight. Um, I don't, no one's really talking about this, generally speaking. Uh, as an American, I guess we are not. But other countries, makes sense. when you're talking about a global Internet access, that might be a concern that um, that might come up. I was looking forward to seasteading with it, but I guess that's not going to happen. <laughs> you, you just harshed my vibe, man. <laughs> Sorry. I'm doubting my vibe now. No, I'm looking forward to it because I want to be able to do these shows anywhere uh, anywhere in the world, right? Wouldn't that be cool? But you're, you, I didn't even think about flash mobs. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. Flash, not flash mobs, flash boys. The, uh, the idea that uh, uh, high-speed transactions, computerized oh, transactions. Oh, yeah, flash trades. Flash yeah. trades. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was thinking about uh, that book, Flash Boys. Go ahead. I'm sorry. We interrupted. Uh, we got cross signals because of the latency. Oh, uh, See, that's another thing gonna... it had fix. No more latency. Yeah. 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 I, all I was going to say was, um, you know, this was a big uh, tech earnings week. And um, you can argue if Tesla is a tech company. But like of all the companies that had a great uh, earnings this week was, was Tesla for sure. And like, you know. So uh, the the thing that made me want to say that is that you were like, well, uh, Elon Musk hasn't hasn't done anything controversial lately. So like that's part of the thing contributing to the wind at their back for sure. Yeah, they did lose money though. They had a they had a uh, a good a good quarter. I'm confused because I saw both that they lost money and had a good quarter. It's because essentially they're going to be able to deliver half a million vehicles. Right. Like the wind is at their back in the sense that like maybe they can have like all of their competitors on the high end are, are more expensive. Um, they're coming in right in the middle than the cheaper ones. I'm the, rooting for the them. I, I, yeah, yeah. Please don't get me wrong. I am rooting for them. I, I really uh, I'm a, I'm all in on electric vehicles. I just I, and it's thanks to Elon that we even have these. I think. Uh, let's take a break and we'll get some uh, final thoughts and stories in here. But first, a word from Zip Recruiter. Zip Recruiter is the way to hire, and I could tell you from our own experience, it's amazing. Uh, of course, it's a great place to go if you're looking for a job. But if you're hiring, Zip Recruiter makes it so much faster, so much easier, so much more effective. You probably saw the uh, ads with uh, Cafe Altura's, uh, which is a, a coffee uh, shop. Uh, their COO, Dylan Miskovitz, was looking for a director of coffee, having a hard time finding qualified applicants, switched to ZipRecruiter. And that's when, the, and we've used this too, and it really, it really helps. They will, besides the fact that ZipRecruiter puts your posting on more than 100 other job boards, it takes all the incoming uh, applications, puts them in the ZipRecruiter interface, formatting the resume so they're easy to read. They have screening questions so you can eliminate people that aren't right for you. It makes it very, very simple. They don't jam your inbox. All of the benefits of ZipRecruiter. But one thing they do that's really cool is ZipRecruiter's technology will look at your posting and find people who have the right experience and then tell them about you. They promote your posting. They'll invite them to apply for your job. And that's what Dylan discovered he, he had qualified candidates apply within hours. In just a few days, he found his director of coffee. We had the same experience. Literally, within a few hours, qualified candidates started rolling in. It's a great feeling, especially because, it, you know, if you're the person who does hiring at your company, it's so hard. A small company like ours, somebody leaves. We've got two weeks' notice. We've got to fill that job. We're going to be slammed. It's going to be hard. And the fact that we can get great applicants and we get them fast makes such a difference for us. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. That is a technology that really works. I, you got to try ZipRecruiter. It's effective no matter what size business. You could try it for free at our web address. It's a special address. It lets them know you, you heard it here. ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. Z-I-P, Zip. Recruiter, R-E-C-R-U-I-T-E-R, ZipRecruiter.com slash twit, T-W-I-T. It's the smartest way to hire. We've used it. We use it now for every opening, and it makes such a big difference. 
Highly recommend it. ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. Thank you, ZipRecruiter, for doing such a great job for us. Caltech. Big payday for Caltech. If the uh, decision is upheld, I imagine Apple and Broadcom will appeal. Um, Apple is ordered to pay $837.8 million to Caltech. Broadcom, $270 million, more than $1.1 billion for patent infringement. Caltech filed suit in federal court in 2016 saying that those Broadcom chips and Apple phones infringed, the Wi-Fi chips infringed on Caltech's patents. Uh, the jury said, you're right. It's the sixth largest patent-related verdict ever. Of course, Apple and Broadcom will appeal, and a lot of times on appeal, these numbers get uh, shrunk. But still, a uh, big victory for uh, Caltech. Do you know during the podcast um, lawsuit where I forget the name of the company um, was saying that all podcasts yeah. uh, infringe on our patents? Yeah. And one of the discussions was, do we challenge the patent or do we not? Uh, in this specific, the Apple challenged the patents, Apple and Broadcom, and uh, most of them were rejected except for four. Uh, they chose to go ahead and investigate, and they found in favor of the plaintiff, Oops. not the defendant, which means that Apple actually lost uh, four of those challenges to, to those patents were upheld. And so this makes their case even weaker. Um, so they probably are going to lose uh, even yeah. if they appeal because the, the patents have been seen as valid. You can if you have a, you know, a patent dispute. And this was the conversation with the podcast patent. You can go back to the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office and do something called an inter partes appeal where you say, hey, can you look at these patents and, and see if they're legit it it it, it short circuits the process if the patent and trademark office looks at and you and by the way you offer documents saying look here's prior art blah 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 and if they agree with you it short circuits the whole thing you don't have to go to court but as you point out wesley there's a huge risk in fact our attorneys suggested we not do this because if the uspto agrees with the patent then when they go to a jury they say look even they appealed in the patent and trademark office even said this is a good patent. And apparently that was uh, important in this uh, trial. Uh, to Adam Carolla's credit, I want to give him eternal thanks. He raised money. He had crowdfunded it and did, in fact, uh, fight against the patent troll. And the Electronic Frontier Foundation did the uh, went to the USPTO for an inter partes. They decided to do it, even though our attorney said, oh, don't do that. And they won. And uh, that short-circuited it. So thank you, EFF and Adam Carolla, because uh, that patent uh, lawsuit could have killed podcasting. Could have been a bad, bad thing. Instead, it went away. Speaking of going away, Sonos. <laughs> and Gadget, great piece from you, Devendra. Every smart device you love will die, starting with Sonos. A little dramatic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's an important point, though. Yeah. Make the point. Tell us why you say this. Well, it's something, you know, last week we heard about Sonus's plan to retire some of their 10 year old products. And uh, so, like the first Play 5, some of the first uh, bridges, I believe, that they released. And basically, they said that they were going to end support. And also, if you were using those devices and had modern Sonos hardware, um, none of your hardware would be updated because it's all kind of a, a dated network and they're all mesh connected. So you couldn't have like old stuff and new stuff running together. Um, I think it just made it clear that this wondrous bounty of connected gadgets we're living in, uh, this is the cost, is that they will they will die and much faster than similar gadgets of the past, right? Like I know people running speakers, hi-fi speakers that are decades old, like speakers from the 70s. They can still run today because they're all running over a, a nice standard uh, wired connection. And that's been consistent for the last several decades. And we just don't have that anymore. And smart devices, because they, they, they're they basically tiny computers, they won't be able to run newer software and newer updates. They'll just have to be you know retired eventually. Your only choice as a consumer is to upgrade. And I think for Sonos in particular, that was a bad it was a it was a big hit to Sonos fans because you could easily, you know, spend thousands of dollars equipping your house with smart Sonos speakers. And now it looks like the company just is going to be killing support and 
also giving you a really bad way to upgrade. Um, <laughs> they have this thing called recycle mode that'll fundamentally kill an old device completely, irrevoc- irrevocably, like you can't even restore it. Um, and they'll give you 30% off new hardware. And you'll do this all again in 10 years, maybe. And it's just kind of a, to me, it's kind of a mess. And it just shows like th- this stuff won't last forever. Smart devices may make our lives easier, but they will die so- like far sooner than older gadgets of the past. I went to my this Sonos is- account and said, it says you have 11 legacy products that do not receive uh. software updates and new features as of May 2020. 11. The sad thing is, as you can see, I also have a lot of modern stuff and yep. I can't share the network with all this old stuff. <laughs> Keep scrolling and, down, Leo, because they're, they're, that's what I have. This is my entire house. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah, man. yeah. Boy, this, by the way, is what I was telling people Look at about that. Sonos. Like, <laughs> I, t- 10 years ago, I was telling people, like, yeah, this Sonos stuff sure looks great. I don't know what they're going to do with this stuff software-wise. Uh, like, I don't know if you should invest in this ecosystem. And now, like, yeah, the chickens are coming home to roost, I guess. Lesson and, learned. Yeah. Lesson yeah. learned. It, this There is durable goods like speakers, and there is software hardware products like computers and you shouldn't put them together into one thing because one's going to superannuate and the other one's going to go on forever and but but guess what when the software dies so leo my dead. father is an obsessive ebay guy that goes on to get 70s era speakers and and yeah and yeah. those yeah. great old clip horns they're great he pays thousands of dollars for these things that still work yeah like four or five owners later yeah and sound fantastic yeah so i mean the the lesson uh and and i and i presume you talked about this in your article the lesson is uh decouple right don't get a smart well, tv get a tv plus a smart the, device those, those don't exist anymore every tv is a smart device i know but you, you, you can't get a dumb tv anymore so <laughs> here's the thing right we are we're on a path it's a slippery slope like we can't stop this but i think like a lot of people complaining, like the upper over this, for Sonos to be like, okay, we're going to figure out some way yeah, to but make they your didn't. older devices and the new stuff work eventually. We don't know how. Yeah, but what they, they basically said is, okay, you'll now have two networks, the new devices and the old devices. But yeah, we what? don't we don't know specifically yet. They haven't announced the update, so it's something. It's better than nothing. But yeah, um, I think when you're thinking about this stuff, Certainly, you want to have an, a, an another way to use your devices if the app dies, if the company goes you know, bankrupt. The problem with the Sonos stuff is that a lot of the early hardware didn't even have 3.5mm jacks. Um, I know the Play 5 did, but when they kill the Play 1 and the Play 3, um, those don't have other jacks. So you can't do anything with them if you can't use the Sonos app anymore. Well, and even uh, the, that's in, the bigger problem. even the line-in jack, uh, you need in software to tell it, use it. Oh boy, yeah. So I think you still need the software. You can't just plug something in and have it play through that speaker. This the software has to say, "Oh yeah, take the aux jack. Don't don't." This is the price of convenience basically. Like yeah. the price of extreme convenience is extreme like uh, heartbreak once things start to fall apart. <sighs> I'm telling you, they've harshed my vibe again. 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 I've been trying. I'm trying to I don't want to doubt my vibe, but I'm I can't help doubt my vibe. By the way, pro tip for listeners. Um, if you want really good sounding speakers, you could get a soundbar, you could get a Sonos or something. Buy buy a receiver. Buy some nice speakers and like just live with a like couple wires. Like a stereo. Wires. Like the old a days. Stereo. Like the old from days. A, like, from eBay, from the 1970s. Yeah. And the well, you could from, do that. You could exactly. do that too. From, you could do that Brian's too. Brian's dad. Saying, <laughs> he's got decouple. about 12 of them in his house. He'll sell them to you. <laughs> No, I, I have a stereo. Smart. That's what I have all those Sonos connects connected into the stereo. So at least the stereo lives on, right? The the receivers and the speakers all are fine. You um, can totally do that. But you can decouple the smarts, like you were saying, Leo. Like decouple. have the receiver be yeah. the thing that you upgrade every couple yeah. of years with new standards and that's new tech. Right. Have the speakers be these devices on the ends that you can just plug anything in. And by the way, you'll get there you go. You'll get uh better speakers i mean i sonos Amazing is fine speakers. but you'll get much better speakers for the price go look at the elac debuts ELAC. like i i made a elac so those good. are so i made good. a big home theater upgrade a couple of years ago i spent two thousand bucks or so yeah. on like nice pioneer atmos speakers and they sound incredible like it's life-changing and smart speakers are all the rage right now but you can have smart you know stuff you can have connectivity connected to old yeah speakers. most av Pretty. receivers are now uh yep. smart 
uh, they do radio They're smart. and all that stuff. Yeah. They've got Sonos Connect. They've got Chromecast. They've got a lot of things. They've got AirPlay now. Yeah. Bluetooth. Like, yeah, you could do anything with this them. This is uh, ELAC. They are really, really nice. And yeah. relatively Their debut expensive. speakers yeah. are phenomenal. Yeah. Very, very nice. Um, you got your revenge, by the way, Wesley Faulkner. Gina Rometty, they've finally How's retired it? Oh, her. Oh, no. You got your revenge, buddy. <laughs> was Virginia... Re Everyone knew she was leaving. Yeah. Every, when you turn yeah. 60, you're out. That's you're just... Out. Uh, yeah. it, it, it's, it, everyone knew that this day would come. CEO of IBM, she's retiring. 60, really? That's when you retire? Yeah. once you hit 60, you oh, have man. to retire. Yeah. Man. Uh. 60 or 65? 60? Maybe 65. I forget. But, like... In the old days, a, you get a, a gold number, watch. You hit it, you're yeah. out. Yeah, yeah. 65 they get they, you get to keep your pocket protector and it's out the door arvind K krishna will take over as ceo in april ibm does ibm even make, make computers anymore do what are they, it's a oh, absolutely really uh i yes absolutely well not personal computers they make uh <laughs> mainframe servers their power their power series power oh, okay. nine right. uh they make mainframe still which is actually where they get a bulk of their money still to this not day consulting is in their and, and mainframe is the bulk of their money where they make a, the big chunk of it uh, because people in, in the highly regulated industry like um, insurance or uh, government work, uh, there's a whole lot of certifications you needed, right. need and uh, mainframes are still one of the only that consolidate all of those certifications for transactions um, and able to, to manage all of that um, in, in terms of redundancy and uptime. Um, they're expensive, but you can literally shoot it with a, a shotgun and it still runs. Wow. Um, and so, yeah, they still make servers. They may still make server arrays, um, just most of the high-end stuff. They are moving to services and the cloud, which also signifies why uh, the change in leadership is people with a lot of deep cloud knowledge. Yeah, right. Krishna is a, a, cl is a cloud guy. I should mention Wesley used to work for them. That's how he knows all this. <laughs> <laughs> he had a little something to do with uh, with the. He still bleeds blue, apparently. Uh, good news: the California oh, wow. Attorney General is uh, delaying the sale of the .org domain. This was kind of shocking. Mm -hmm. um, I can sold it to a for-profit company shortly after they eliminated profit, uh, eliminated price caps. On .org domains, and Ethos Capital bought it, but that is now going to be held up um, by the state of California. So that's, I think, that's good news because that was a little bit not such good news. I thought. You ready for the sixty-two brand new emoji? Do you know? Can you believe there are three thousand three hundred and four emoji? These are the new ones. I I could never find the one I need. Never. That's it's going to get list, worse. It's way too long. There's yeah. too many of them. There's a a bride with a mustache. Thank God. They finally Santa Claus can be any color you want these days. They also have uh I don't know what flag is that? I don't know. This is something. They have, have a Ned Flanders I think it's a trans flag. Uh, yeah, Ned Flanders trans feeding a baby with a <laughs> yeah. bottle. Ned, <laughs> Ned Flanders is now feeding a baby. That's good. Uh, they have uh, green peppers. They have fondue with the Swiss cross on it. An olive. What is this? What is that? What is what is that? Is that a crumpet? What is that? Pancake? Is that a roti? What is that? <laughs> Pancake? Blueberries. They've got uh, boba, the boba drink, the little tapioca things. Is this uh, tamale? Is that a burrito? No one knows. No one, no one knows. There's a, a seal, a dodo. We don't need extinct. Look, you start doing extinct, it never stops. We don't need extinct. You got a There's like a mastodon on there. Oh, you're right. So we got extinct. We got army helmet. We got saw. We got a hook. That'll be useful. A ladder. A this pin. is great anti-Super Bowl counter programming. programming this is why people tune in Twit when they could be watching Going down the, emojis. the big game. <laughs> lungs? They got lungs now. <laughs> We've needed lungs. Just think how you'll be able to use this to, to make conversation. And I'm glad the Groucho Marx 
mustache yeah. and eyebrows. There was a great article, I forget who did it, about how you can propose emojis. It's a pretty simple process. Oh, yeah. We had, to fill out a form. Jeremy yeah. Bruges has been on our shows many times. He's on the, uh, there he is. He is on the um, Unicode Emoji <laughs> Committee. It's a very important <laughs> job. There he is actually on uh, Tech News Weekly this week talking about the new emojis. So he's a, he runs Emojipedia. Are nice. you going to buy a Hummer truck? We're going to watch tonight the Super Bowl. It's actually probably right now. <laughs> Second quarter ad for the new Hummer electric super truck. 1,000 horsepower. They're not going to show it till May. So don't get your hopes up. That's all we get. <laughs> the bumper. That's all. I'm glad just more people are getting into this arena of electric oh, and yeah. electric vehicles, especially yeah. in the truck. We need a lot of competition in order for each one to push them forward. I agree 100 percent, Wesley. Mm -hmm. This one will be a full on triangle, just like. <laughs> 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 Ladies now, and gentlemen, we, I think it's time to go watch a football game. I thank you so much for being here, Brian McCullough, the tech meme right home. Everybody must listen every single day. If you go to techmeme.com, as I do every morning, I just press play. That's it. Well, or or uh, at 5 p.m. Eastern every day. Well, I'm, uh, I'm once listening. you're once you're done with the entire Twit uh, catalog, then I can hear what happened at 5 p.m. every day Eastern. That's when it. That's when it's published. Uh, thank you, Brian. Always great to see you. Thank Former you, internet horse, uh, historian, now officially a professional. Just Podcaster. Just a podcaster. Apparently. Just a, a, a lowly podcaster. <laughs> Don't say that. It's a, it's a <laughs> prestigious position. Wesley Faulkner, he's at MongoDB, does uh, developer relations there. It's always great to see you, Wesley. What's your T-shirt say? I didn't ask. It says, uh, are you AI ready? Uh, my, uh, oh, are you? I. Uh, it is an old uh, IBM shirt. That's I why I was, was showing a little my blue. arm. I thought it was a little blue. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Yes. And if I could, I would like to plug Please. Um, something. Um, a personal hero of mine is releasing a book later on this month on February 18th. Um, her name is Susan Fowler. I'm not sure if you're familiar with her I work. I am. I love her. But her book is called Whistleblower, uh, My Journey to Silicon Valley. A fight for justice at Uber. So she's detailing a lot of personal stuff that wasn't public during that whole fiasco after her blog post outing the sexual harassment and um, it was her memo and, that and, really and brought that Travis Kalanick down. Yes, and uh, good. I can't wait to. I don't know her, but I um, look forward to reading this whistleblower. And um, for those who love audiobooks, the audiobook is actually cheaper right now um, oh. than the printed book. Gosh. And so um, it comes out on the 18th, like I said, and she has pa paved the way for a lot of people, made things a lot easier for us, uh, even though the fight is really early in its infantry. Uh, in it's it's early. <laughs> I won't try to say that word again. Um, <laughs> that that. The things that she went through and the things that she continues to go through because of this um, allows us to keep having this conversation and making things better at our respective companies, um, using her as a, a template to try to change things. In, in so a way, I, I she respect started, her and I can't wait for this. Out. It wasn't just the fall of Travis Kalanick. She really was the first, the beginning of the Me Too movement, wasn't it? Even, mm -hmm. even, yeah, in terms of tech, Weinstein. yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I would say she's, um, I mean, there was, uh, was it Ellen Powell, uh, who tried, went to court, uh, yeah. for, uh, some discrimination she was suffering at her VC forum, um, and that did not go well, yeah. and didn't go in her favor. But yeah. in terms of real change, um, you can't help but see Susan Fowler as, uh, an agent of change in, in a lot of tech cultures. Very nice. Whistleblower, my journey to Silicon Valley and, Fight for Justice at Uber. Be out next month. Actually, no, it'll be out soon. Two weeks. Thank you, Wesley. Great to see you again. Thank you to Devendra Hardawar. He is not only senior editor at Engadget, but he does a must-listen to podcast for anybody who loves media slash film. Where can we get yeah. that? It's the Slash Film cast. You can find it at SlashFilm.com or just, you know, search iTunes. And, uh, yeah, we chat about movies every week. I also do – I co-host the Engadget podcast, which we've just started revving back up, and that's me oh, and Sherlyn Lowe. Yeah, oh, it's, we love it's great. 
Oh, nice. And Sherlin's awesome. Like, yeah. so it is basically the two of us yelling at each other every <laughs> week. But I think it's a it's a good dynamic. Uh, last week, we just broke down the Clearview AI story and kind of what it means for the, you know, the impact of facial recognition technology. And also we talked about, um, you know, uh, Billie Eilish's Grammy win and kind of what she was able to do nice. in a spare bedroom in her home and the kind of home tech Isn't that, that amazing? can now win Grammys. Yeah, Thanks it's to SoundCloud. It's amazing. So good. Really is a mind. It's that's to me the most exciting story of the Grammys this year is Billie mm -hmm. Eilish and how she did it. Uh, great. I will be listening. Another podcast to add to your list. Thank you for so much, Devendra, for joining us. Thank you. We do Twitter every Sunday afternoon, 2.30 Pacific, 5.30 Eastern, 22.30 UTC. You can watch us or listen live at twit.tv slash live. You can also uh, download shows after the fact at twit.tv. Or as we have mentioned many times, subscribe in your favorite podcast application. That way we don't get any information about you. No, I just want you to subscribe so that you get it every week. Just in time for your Monday morning commute. Once again, it's time to uh, take the Twit annual audience survey. Don't forget twit.to slash survey20. We appreciate it. Thank you. Um, thank you all for being here. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you next time. Another Twit. This is amazing. Doing the Twit. Doing the Twit.